probably answer. We figure 200, 250 questions a year that we take on, on the phone about farm pond management. Anything from fish stocking to a lot of aquatic vegetation management, aerating ponds, I mean, building ponds. Um, and we can provide advice on all that. Um, question we get a lot is, can you come out and look at our pond? Well, not really. In southeast Iowa, if we did that, that's all we'd do. There's so many ponds and so many people that want advice. Most issues we can address on the phone. You know, and then I've, I've actually had a few, one in Fairfield that's been a real conundrum. We went through the whole gamut of problems that it could be and didn't seem like anything fit. And, find that I was like, I'm going to come out and look. And I did. And, uh, you know, what they were telling me was accurate. Uh, but I think we've been able to solve that too. That was turbidity issues. And um, they just didn't know why they started and how to clear them up. But I think we're getting there. They've got fine, uh, fine clay turbidity problems. So this material is staying suspended. Um, we don't know exactly why it started. You know, if they've got bullheads in the pond that are stirring it up, um, if the, you know, the pond is shallowed over time and, you know, it's getting stirred up by wind and wave action, but regardless, it's staying uh, cloudy all the time. And so we're trying to address uh, that particular problem and hopefully next summer we can help them clear that up a little bit. But ponds age and they change, they don't look like a real nice pond their entire life. We'll kind of learn about that in a bit, but start out so you've got a pond but you got to think bigger than that you got to think about the watershed what is a watershed it's the area around it that you know basically drains a large area drains all the water that falls in it you know from the rain etc through ditches streams it can come over the ground even through the ground and make its way to the pond so any pond or lake has a watershed. Anything in that watershed obviously could impact your pond. If we've got row crop here and loose ground and we've got water running over the surface, that can make its way to your pond. If it makes it way, its way to a stream, of course that's going to carry that material and nutrients to your pond. So it can fill in your pond. We call that sedimentation. It can bring nutrients in and that's often uh, what really causes your problems with vegetation. They like nutrients and vegetation is going to grow very well if it's got lots of nutrients. So, and this can be miles away. For example, Lake Darling has a 12,500 acre watershed. That's a really big area that drains into one place. So most of you probably haven't considered pond zonation. Um, and this is kind of important when you get into things like aeration etc. A lot of people want to aerate their pond. Well, you probably need to understand how aeration would work. Um, and just that begins by understanding how a pond is kind of broken down. Um, so near shore, we call that the littoral area. Um, the littoral area is where a lot of your production occurs. Think about it. It's relatively shallow. Um, that's where light is penetrating uh, through the water all the way to the bottom. Um, when you get that, that's conducive to veg growth um, because it, you've got nice warm water here and lots of habitat. That's where things like to live. Uh, plants producing are giving off lots of oxygen in the littoral zone. So it's going to be conducive to lots of animals and life living in that particular area. You drop a little further down into the pond or lake. You've got the sublittoral zone, usually still pretty well oxygenated. You're going to have some plant growth, still some light penetration down that deep, but you know, it's becoming a little bit more sparse of life. There's still some there, but not so much as in the littoral zone. Drop a little further into the profundal zone. Now we're getting down to some pretty dark water, not a whole light, a lot of light down uh, that deep for that matter. Um, so not, not a whole lot of life. Actually things that are dying up above kind of settle out down into the profundal zone and into that benthic zone down below. And that's where a lot of decomposition is occurring. The bacteria that decompose dead things to break it down, they consume oxygen. So essentially, you know, you're getting to areas that are pretty devoid of oxygen. Um, 
you're getting a uh, production of CO2, which I'll kind of explain why that is a little bit later. Um, but, you know, this is where you start to develop then, if you look vertically, layers of water. This zone up here called the epilimnion up on the surface is getting a lot of light penetration. It's getting warm by the sun. Okay, the light is used by organisms like phytoplankton or microscopic algae might be a better word that are uh, inhabiting that water column um, and providing food for zooplankton, you know, and then eventually small fishes that supply food for larger fishes, etc., etc. Then you have down below the hypolimnion, and as I explained before, that encompasses your profundal and benthic zones, not a whole lot of oxygen down there. Why? Well, there's no light. It really, it's all filtered out by the time it gets way down there. Um, it's not, the light is not heating that water. It's relatively cool down there and devoid of oxygen. In between, you've probably heard the term thermocline. Okay, and that's where you're going to have a uh, pretty rapidly changing uh, temperature. You know, up above, it's relatively uniform if you think about it. Um, you got wind action that's kind of mixing that upper light layer of water, stirring that all up. So you got relatively uniform oxygen. It begins to drop relatively rapidly every foot through the thermocline. And then when you get down here, this hypolimnion is not getting stirred really at all. And it's very uniform in temperature as well, very cold. So much colder than up above and devoid of oxygen. Hey Chad, how yes. does that picture change um, like right now ice fishing? Yeah, so it changes, you know, this would be more um, formation uh, of layers like in the summertime. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Because that's when you're going to get really strong sun rays and heat, you know. In the fall, we get what's called turnover. Everybody's heard of turnover. So the water at the top, you know, starts dropping in temperature. The sun is, is less radiant and not heating that water. And eventually this upper layer drops to about 39 degrees Fahrenheit. Then we get a windy day and it's going to push that more dense water now down, you know, and then it begins to mix. And it, as it mixes, that's what we call fall turnover. At that point, you don't have this layering effect anymore. The pond becomes pretty well uniform in oxygen. But then as we go through winter time, um, you know, things are still dying. Things are still decomposing. And now you've got, say, ice and snow on top, little photosynthesis. Everything that's occurring down here in terms of decomposition and then fish and aquatic organisms breathing or using up the oxygen and what happens is okay so we're uniform top to bottom a month into winter you know we've got devoid oxygen down here again this layer has got no oxygen and as we go another month say into winter all of a sudden half the pond is devoid of oxygen a little further into winter three quarters of the pond is devoid of oxygen and then we better get ice out pretty darn quick because if we don't, if we have a real late winter with snow and ice, it may make it all the way to the top. And if it does, that's called winter kill, right? So that's how it changes. Now we get a turnover in spring too. Essentially, you know, the ice comes off, you know, your water begins to heat up a little bit, gets real dense and heavy at 39 degrees and it mixes once again. So it gets rid of, you know, you have a lot of deoxygenated water after ice out and all of a sudden it takes a breath and it gets oxygenated again. What kind of range depth would you find at thermocline? Yeah, it, right. It can change greatly because, you know, the, we've got cloudy days and sunny days and windy days and stagnant days. But, you know, generally, you know, um, I've seen it uh, in nice clear water, you know, clear ponds, good water clarity. It can be down 10 or 12 feet, you know. Um, you know, some years, well, Lake Darling before we did the renovation was real turbid and we'd have a thermocline set up at three feet, you know, so it can, it previously. can vary. Yeah, previously. No. Now, now we have much better water clarity for the majority of the year and we're down into that seven, eight, nine, ten foot range. And it can move a little bit throughout the day, you know, depending on 
angle of the sun and how much radiant energy is hitting the pond and things like that. But big mistake too, you know, okay, you go out in the middle of summer and you know, you got catfish in your pond and boom, you cast down on the bottom and you're waiting for the catfish to come and you don't catch anything. What happened to all my fish? Well, they're not there where you casted your bait because they can't breathe down there. So in the summer, you know, uh, end of July and August, your fish are probably pushed up into this upper layer of water. So you'd be better off fishing with the bobber um, or, you know, fishing along the bank in some of these shallow areas where the fish are likely uh, inhabiting and breathing much easier than they would if they were down below. Make sense? So, so uh, with the lakes up north, it's a whole different dynamic. It's like, you know, Walker and Pikes Bay and Cass Lake. Yep. <laughs> do they have fish kills sometimes? Yes. Yep. Yeah, sure they would. Yep, yep. Well, now you go up, up north, I mean, they're definitely going to have zonation. It's mainly going to be in the summertime, but up there you can have real extended winters. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I mean, they can have fish kills, but typically, you know, if a lake's really good size, it means it goes into winter. And I'm talking in terms of surface area volume. You know, if it's really good size, it's going to carry a lot of oxygen into winter, you know. Right. Yeah, yeah, and the reason they make it through is because a lot of those big natural lakes have a lot of surface area. They go into winter in a much better position than say if you had a three-quarter acre pond. Yeah, yeah this is gonna sheer volume, sheer volume. volume. Yeah. exactly, exactly. So most often they'll make it through, but could you know a large lake typically won't kill. But you know, I mean, if it was a really, really nasty, severe winter and you had ice cover and snow cover on top of that that reduced any light penetration, it would make it more susceptible. Yeah. You know, definitely for sure. Yeah, smaller ponds are definitely more susceptible to so winter. If you're ice fishing, theoretically, it's early in the season. Yes. Right. right. So the fish are lower, but they'll move up with the correct. Okay. Oxygen. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. So like if you're fishing the same place, you know, just before ice out that you are right now, probably not going to have as good a luck because you're fishing too deep, you know, so. Yeah. But nowadays we have, you know, Bexlars and yeah. cameras and we can cheat, <laughs> you know. So a lot of people still figure that out pretty quick. But this is kind of a similar picture, you know, this kind of uh, alludes to, you know, photosynthesis is happening in an upper layer. Photosynthesis is the production of energy by plants, they're giving off oxygen as byproduct. That's where a lot of that oxygen then that, you know, animals that are respiring can use it. But down on that bottom, you know, you're gonna get respiration exceeding photosynthesis. Photosynthesis cannot happen without light. So if there's no light down there, you know, animals, uh, which mainly be bacteria and things, benthic invertebrates are relying on respiration. Um, and they're using up that oxygen and that helps it, that's this layer or this area become devoid of oxygen eventually. So, yep, yeah, so you can see that, you know, this upper layer, that's really, you hear, or probably heard the term primary productivity. And that's where that's happening. That's where, you know, plants are producing energy, giving off oxygen. Um, all the things that are expiring and inhabiting that oxygenated upper layer because they can breathe and they can exist without expending a lot of energy. They will inhabit the thermocline a little bit. It's still well oxygenated, but temperatures dropping pretty rapidly through that thermocline and they will not uh, really inhabit the hypolimnion because if they go down there for any length of time, first of all, it's cold. Second of all, they can't breathe. So you will not find them there once you get this zonation setting up. So down here, again, accumulation of dead things, organic matter, that's all being broken down. And that's another sink for oxygen. Oxygen is going to be used in this respiration decomposition process here. Is there an apparatus that you guys can drop down there? Mm -hmm. There is. Yes, yeah, to like measure the dissolved yeah. oxygen. Yeah, so it's simply a dissolved oxygen meter. Um, Ours is pretty fancy, you know, it's a multi-thousand dollar piece of equipment, but just a little handheld unit, you know, for reading with a screen. But, you know, usually we have like a 50 foot cord on it with a, you know, um, an oxygen probe 
on the end of it and we can drop it down. We have the 50 foot cord incrementally marked about every foot. So we can take that reading and then you can actually plot that reading. And if you were, if you can just, here, I'm gonna back up one. This one might even be better. If you were to plot that data, you just kind of imagine if I drew a line, you know, up here uh, in the epilimnion, it's relatively uniform. So the beginning part of that line down to the thermocline would just be, you know, if we had temperature down here on the axis, it'd be about the same temperature. Wouldn't really change. We hit the thermocline and all of a sudden it kind of takes off at an angle here and, and starts to drop relatively rapidly. We get to the hypolimnion and below and that temperature now is colder but uniform again. So this kind of looks like that, if that makes any sense. So. It seems like a lot of people judge, hey, how's, how deep's your pond? Right. At a certain point, it doesn't matter, does it? No, yeah, yep. That's one thing. That's right, true. yeah. People say, well, my pond's 40 foot deep, so walleye should be able to do great. Well, it does, it's not any different than any other pond. In the summer, they may only inhabit the top 10 feet, you know, so, yeah. So depth, it does it matter? Yes. I mean, that ha habitat is available after fall turnover, right? So they can utilize it during parts of the year, but the majority of the year really doesn't make any difference. So, so we talked a lot about like photosynthesis. What is that? Well, here's the formula for it. It's water plus carbon dioxide. If you remember back from, you know, high school chemistry, and it needs light. That's why light is so important. And that's why in that upper layer of water, you know, you're having most of your primary productivity. It's producing sugar for those plants to give them energy and they're giving off oxygen, which is great for animals that like to breathe oxygen, right? That's your dissolved oxygen that we're talking about. DO can also, and most often the biggest source of oxygen is the atmosphere. You know, as it blows across the lake or pond, it's injecting oxygen into the water. Um, aeration. What is aeration doing? Well, the bubbles are putting oxygen in the water, right? A little bit, but not really. You know, what it's really doing is the bubble screen is pushing the water up and mixing it. Why would you mix your water? Yeah. Yep, push it up to the surface and let it get oxygenated and push it back down. So essentially, you're preventing zonation, right? you're keeping a uniform oxygen level. That being said, what if I waited till August to turn on my aerator? Is that a good idea? Yeah, probably not because you're probably layered pretty good at that point, right? The bottom layer of water would be no oxygen whatsoever. So if you mix no oxygen with some decent or pretty low, you know, in late summer, pretty low oxygen, right? You know, um, Warm water is not very dense. It doesn't hold as much oxygen as, you know, cold water that is very dense. So you've got lower oxygen levels, plenty to sustain life, don't get me wrong, but lower oxygen levels. Now we're mixing no oxygen with lower oxygen levels and we're reducing oxygen pond wide, right? And, you know, if the oxygen level was sufficient but not super high up above, we could lower it pond wide and actually cause fish kill in some areas by doing that. So aeration really needs to be turned on best time after spring turnover, right? Pond's fully oxygenated. We're gonna prevent zonation from ever happening. Okay, could we turn it off in the fall? Well, you could, you know, or you could leave it on all year um, and keep, you know, a hole open uh, on top of the ice. That would be the goal to let oxygen kind of inject from the atmosphere, you know. So timing really does matter. Um, you should turn it on after spring turnover if you're using aeration and then you should leave it run and not turn it off. Don't be, you know, flipping the switch on and off all the time. That's not gonna do you a bit of good. Once the aeration is on, it needs to stay on. If you haven't turned it on by July or August, then don't turn it on at all. It's gonna hurt you more than help. So respiration, a little bit, it's almost really the opposite, right? A photosynthesis, you know, we've got sugar and oxygen that, you know, these animals are taking in and, you know, we're going to produce water 
carbon dioxide, right? So down in the, um, you know, uh, hypolimnion, that deoxygenated layer, remember, you know, CO2 levels were increasing. That's because, you know, bacteria were respiring, they're using up oxygen, giving off CO2. That's why those levels went up. And essentially the goal is to produce energy. So, you know, things like us can, can live in, in the case of a pond fish. So decomposition um, is done by aerobic bacteria, meaning they're consuming oxygen uh, in that process. And so, uh, you know, one of the things that I mentioned earlier, so we've got these folks that have a pond that's, you know, it's got some water clarity issues, you know, so what could we do? Um, you could apply things like uh, gypsum, or alum, you've ever heard of alum? Problem is they all come with negatives. You know, alum would actually, you know, it, it binds to fine clay particles and then settles out, but in turn it increases pH and it messes with the pH in the pond. And so we solved one issue and maybe we created a pH issue. Gypsum can be used, same sort of premise. It binds, you know, with the, you know, that clay material, um, maybe the pH doesn't swing quite as much. Um, people have taken alfalfa hay and spread it around. Um, and, you know, uh, that can also kind of help bind uh, those clay particles as well. But then all that material that you're using to bind the clay particles has to decompose as well, um, which means bacteria are consuming oxygen in that process. So, you know, if you've got a high amount of this stuff um, and it's applied maybe late in the season when oxygen levels are low, like late July, early summer, you could develop areas devoid of oxygen up close, maybe in those littoral areas. Didn't really want to do that and then cause a fish kill. So everything, you got to consider timing. If you're going to do, you know, applications like that, especially with alfalfa hay, it would need to be probably early spring before the heat of the summer really hits, but just kind of a side to keep in mind. So um, I get a lot of these sort of questions. Um, well, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, the pond was, you know, 21 feet deep. And I said, well, what is the pond's depth now? <laughs> you know? That's an important question. And, you know, some people say, well, it's still 21. I said, well, you go out and measure it. And they go out and it's 14, you know. So what has happened? When we build a new pond, looks great. You know, lots of water volume. Um, then, you know, over time, they become smaller and shallower as we get sedimentation. So basically surface runoff, remember, um, could be fed by you know a small stream or spring it's carrying sediment and nutrients you know it's shallower more light penetration we've lost uh, volume and depth we're getting more vegetation growing more time has passed it continues to fill in you know at this point we're really almost just a wetland and not a pond anymore and then with no maintenance over time guess what we'll have is dry land again and it doesn't matter, you know, if you're a natural lake in northern Minnesota or Wisconsin or you're a pond in Iowa, this process is happening. Now, albeit up in, you know, glacial lakes and things, it's happening a lot slower, okay? Um, in agricultural Iowa, um, you know, and then with urban construction, etc., this can happen more rapidly. And obviously, if you're starting off with a pond that was one acre and 15 foot deep, this process can happen uh, very quickly. You know, the pond's gonna be vastly different in 25 years than when you built it, and in 50 years, it might be approaching a wetland, you know, and beyond that, it might just disappear. That's if you don't do any maintenance on it. A lot of people will acquire property with the pond, come in, and it's probably in this state or this state, they wanna regain depth, and we help them figure out a plan. You know, it might involve uh, removing the water, which means resetting the fishery, going in with heavy equipment and excavating the pond back to that state again, starting over, you know. Um, 
what can you do if you're here or here beyond that? Not, not a whole lot, you know. Um, and some people say, well, I can't afford it. Or I don't want to do it. And that's okay. In this state, I mean, it's, it's benefiting things like frogs and salamanders, and, you know, all kinds of amphibians, reptiles, you know, turtles, etc. So that has its place too. But every pond, once it's built, I mean, it's doomed. It's, it's dying from the very start. It's going to go in this direction no matter what. It's just a matter of how quickly, you know. And there are things we can do to slow it down, but it's going to happen regardless. So food web, um, most of you probably learned about this back in, in grade school, but it's just kind of an important thing. Everything is interconnected, and that's what we're just trying to convey here. So down to microscopic algae, your phytoplankton. Um, they're fed on by your zooplankton, which are microscopic animals. So um, then you've got bigger, uh, you know, insect, aquatic insects. So you got animals with exoskeletons here, you know, invertebrates. Bluegills might be next in the food chain. So you got panfish that are, that are feeding on these aquatic insects, maybe even larger zooplankton. And even both of these species, bass and bluegill, as small larvae, juveniles, are going to be utilizing plankton at first and then may, might grow a little bit and graduate to aquatic insects, a little bit bigger. Bluegills are at some point susceptible to predation by largemouth bass and it's really only the largest adults that survive that are not. And it's the largemouth bass that are trimming down these bluegill populations and leaving uh, only a small portion of what was produced that accelerates growth because then you have more of these resources available per individual, if that makes sense. So that's kind of key, you know, as you go to stock upon and understanding the dynamic in the food chain of a farm pond, how that works. If you want to produce big fish, then understanding the food web is important. Now, obviously, that was a very simplistic depiction. It's a lot more crazy. I mean, that's all you can gather from that is... Going back to yep. the bluegill and bass relationship. Yep. I got a buddy who is perched by the only thing that are going to go in his pond. Oh, yeah. But he doesn't have growth of perch. Right. Or reproduction of perch. Right. The bass are this big. Right. His perch are nice, but they're the same ones that he put in five years ago. Right. Yeah. Grew. Yeah. Yep. But it, I can't get through to him that. That's not working. Yeah. Food. Right, yeah, and the thing is, you know, I mean, the first consideration we got to make is we live in southeast Iowa, and, you know, I would look at, you know, so a lot of us get our news, like me, out of Waterloo, and they report, you know, it's going to be 70 degrees. Well, you can count on it being 75 or 6 down here for sure, you know, so we're hot, you know, we're hot down here. That means that the best fish communities we have are warm water fish communities. Perch are not a warm water species. They're a cool water species. That's why they're prevalent in the northern Mississippi and in Minnesota and Wisconsin, you know, South, South Dakota, North Dakota, etc. Yes, northern Iowa. Exactly. So, and do they work well in ponds? Particularly, they work better in a northern Iowa pond than a southern Iowa pond for sure. And, you know, but there's a different dynamic and you'd have to go back and look at, you know, reproductive capabilities, you know. Do they produce as many young as a bluegill and how? You know, um, when I first started, I worked on Lake Michigan, which had a bunch of yellow perch. Well, they kind of broadcast their eggs all over, you know, aquatic vegetation and structure and those sort of, sort of things in big strands. That's very different from a bluegill that builds a little saucer-shaped nest, you know. That's, and, and think about it, you know, I mean, the bluegill's kind of adapted to the environment we have. That's, you know, kind of what it does. So. You've got those differences. So if you're not seeing successful reproduction, the habitat probably isn't there. They're already probably thermally stressed, was my point, or warmer. They're gonna be thermally stressed. That's gonna reduce growth and reproductive capability even more. Are they successful with some reproduction? Probably, but then they get mowed off by the bass that are really hungry. There's not enough to really make them grow to any sort of length. They're sustaining themselves. It's just, you're right, it's a bad situation. It's, it's, not, it's 
not going to get better. It's just going to continue. Eventually, those large yellow perch will die of natural mortality, and there won't be any yellow, yellow perch in the pond. Right? Yeah. They're pets. Yeah, they're pets. Yeah, they'll, you know, so they, the big ones now will provide some good fishing, but as soon as they you know, succumb to natural mortality, now you're left with a pond full of intermediate-sized bass. And that's it. And they're probably going to just get in worse condition because now they have nothing at all whatsoever to eat but each other. So if they are reproducing any, um, they're going to be mowed off. It's a lot of cannibalism at that point. And usually cannibalism will sustain you, but it will not help you grow at all. So we don't recommend yellow perch in, in farm ponds in, in Iowa at all. So you know, what if you disrupt the food chain? So this is a common thing, especially in our larger impoundments is, you know, some of the bass anglers are like, well, you know, gizzard shad, they work great down in Mississippi, you know, and Ross Barnett Reservoir that's, you know, tens and 20, well, heck, it's probably 80,000 acres for that matter. It's huge, you know. Um, and the key is it's a r river reservoir, right? Or gizzard chad inhabited, you know, before they dam that um, particular lake up. You know, that was a, a river system and that's where gizzard chad inhabit. But here they think, you know, people are thinking, well, I want my bass to grow big like they do in Mississippi, so I'll put gizzard chad in my little lake or pond and then everything just goes to pot after that. And that's because they function very differently. Gizzard chad are a planktivore, so they feed on that phytoplankton and zooplankton I talked about. Well, other things feed on the phytoplankton and zooplankton, like small sport fish, like your bluegills, your largemouth bass. They all feed on plankton, at least in the early stage of life. So but now they have to compete with gizzard chad. They get a lot of that food material, which means a lot of these guys starve to death at a young age. They never even get a chance. Um, now, um, let's say those fish are greatly reduced or gone. These fish continue to multiply and feed on that zooplankton and phytoplankton. They consume it so that it becomes scarce and then they switch and go down and feed on the bottom of the lake or pond on detritus. So organic material down there, they can actually consume that to get some energy. What does that do? And in turn, you know, they're mixing it up, rooting for food down at the bottom that increases the turbidity of the lake or pond it reduces light penetration which further reduces the ability of any fish for that matter to find prey and feed especially sight feeders and so that impacts them even worse some of these species may become so deplete or disappear over time sport fisheries are greatly impacted where once you had five pound large largemouth bass maybe all you have is eight inches, if any at all, you know. Bluegill, same deal, they're impacted um, because they can't get the food as they become scarce. The bass cannot feed on the bluegill. So it's just a vicious circle. And then the other big culprit, you know, Asian carp, you've heard about those, the big head and the silver carp. They were brought in uh, to control filamentous algae problems in, in uh, aquaculture ponds, so catfish aquaculture pond. All culture ponds are in the Mississippi Delta and then of course Mississippi River floods and these guys escape to the river and now we have them everywhere, right? And they're very, very prevalent in sections of the Illinois River, Mississippi River, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And they, they are a planktivore. So once again, just like gizzard chad, they are depleting stocks of phytoplankton uh, and zooplankton and causing disruptions to the food chain. So point of that don't stock anything in your pond other than what we kind of tell you and we'll call into our office and we'll tell you what works best and I can just tell you that's bluegill you know largemouth bass channel cat you can have those three if you want a fourth uh, typically red ear sunfish get a little bigger than bluegills um, they're not quite as prolific uh, in terms of reproduction as crappies would crappies work? Yes, in ponds greater than 10 acres. The mistake that is often made is people stock crappies in ponds less than 10 acres. If it's eight or nine acres, maybe you get away with it. You know, if you stock them in a one acre pond, 
a female crappie the size of my hand can produce 350,000 eggs in one spawning event by herself. So even if you have 100 female crappies, 100 males, that's a lot of fish. You're asking your largemouth bass to control usually not only your bluegill population, but your crappie populations. They can't keep up. They'll continue eating until fish are sticking out of their, their mouth, literally. I've seen tails sticking out of their mouth. Once they reach that point, they can't eat anymore. And then these other fish, like crappies and bluegills, keep spawning. In turn, you know, there's not enough resources for those fish, and they stunt. That's where stunting, uh, you've heard that term, where, where that originates, is not getting enough food for each individual. Um, so they're small. So the quality of your fishery has been reduced in terms of the pan fishery. So if you had a five or six acre pond, you wouldn't even put black crappie in there? Uh, black, if I was going to stock one or the other species, it'd be blacks because they're less reproductively capable than the whites a little bit. But the biggest issue is white crappies tend to overlap more in diet with largemouth bass. Whereas the you know black crappie will utilize a lot of the large aquatic insects or macroinvertebrates as well, and so if you're going to have a fighting chance, I'd say with black crappie. But typically, you know, five or six acres would be pushing it. You know, now a lot of people will call me up and say, "But I've had them in there for ten years and I'm okay," and that's probably true. I don't doubt it. But the way crappies operate is a very cyclical pattern in terms of reproduction. They'll have five, six, seven years, you know, of spawning events that really don't produce a whole lot. And then all of a sudden they have the glorious one. They'll just spike. And then from there forward, you're just ruined. You know, you know, it, it'll be a little bit of a lag, you know, as those fish are produced and start to grow big. But the point is, is once you have that big massive spawning event, then the whole pond just kind of goes to pot again, you know, so, now, in some cases, people have gotten lucky and gotten, you know, 15 years down the road before they have that, but it's coming. You know, that's the point. Eventually, it's coming. You'll have it. Oh, pond construction. So, best ponds in Iowa, um, as we talked about the watershed, they have um, watersheds between, between rather 10 and 20 acres for each surface acre of water impounded. So. You know, if you're one acre, I'd probably want something 10 or 12 acres in terms of a watershed. You get a little bit bigger, you can get up to that 20 acre. Definitely don't want something over 20 acres. Um, Lake Darling, I mentioned 12,500 acre watershed. You know, we're pushing 50 to one. Um, we'd want it at most 20 to one watershed to lake area ratio. Um, not ideal, we can't change it now. And in 1950, when they built Lake Darling, watershed science was barely understood, at least by a lot of people, you know. There's worse, I think Backbone Lake, Backbone State Park, be 300 to one watershed to lake area ratio. So obviously they have problems with sedimentation. And then constant changes in land use are happening in that watershed. Lake Darling, we renovated the whole darn thing. Um, didn't hardly have any hog confinements, you know, all the landowners were on board, you know, with best management practices and really trying to preserve water quality and really benefiting themselves, keeping the soil in the fields, you know, that very nutrient rich soil. But, you know, since that was completed, we've had 12 hog confinements go up. Landowners have passed away and passed their land then to, you know, um, sons and daughters, um, just other people for that matter, who use the land differently. And all of a sudden we're seeing, you know, back in Lake Darling, algal blooms, um, we're seeing beach warnings for bacteria and toxic algae, you know. Uh, that all stems from uh, nutrients that are coming from the landscape and how the land is being used. So, we're only talking about five years, aren't we? Yes. Lake Darling. Yeah. Yes, yes, and, and I'm not saying by any stretch, oh, we're back in the same situation, because we're not even close. I mean, Lake Darling is better than it's ever been. But the fact, you know, people come to our beach and they're like, well, I, I thought you fixed this, you know, and all of a sudden there's a beach warning there again, what's going on? Well, we can't change the fact we're a huge watershed, and then we can't control the weather, that's the other thing. So when you get 
heavy periods of rain, which we did this past year, you know, rain all at once and then followed by, you know, three, four weeks of just stagnant hot weather, it's conducive to things like algal growth and things like that. And so, and then a lot of the hog farmers were using, you know, sprinklers and then, you know, anything that runs off from those runs over the landscape into the pond, that's where bacteria comes from. So the geese take a bad rap up there. The geese are... Surely they do put they absolutely do. Well, and deer and everything else, you know, so. It's not anything in relation to what's out on the rest of the landscape. Yeah, not, I would say, just a, a drop in the bucket, you know. So in areas where geese congregate, which is usually beaches, right, they, you know, if you go measure the bacteria levels in the beach, you know, it's sky high. And in fact, when we renovated, we took all that beach sand out and replaced it with brand new stuff, and then slowly over time, those bacteria levels are gonna increase and that's mainly because of the geese. So also like what you need to know is when we, we do, when we post beach warnings, where was the water collected? At the beach, right, <laughs> right off the beach where the geese had been. So it's kind of like a loaded deck already, but it can still be a good indication of what's coming in as well. And in other areas, like we thought one day, holy moly, what happened here? It looked like manure coming in in droves. What it was is a big blue-green algae bloom that had died and then the stuff was all clumped up and decomposing and it looked like you know little like spots of manure all over the place and that's what it, so we actually had our environmental services come out and it's like what is this I mean it looks like manure that stunk just to high heaven it turned out it was decomposing blue-green algae coming, you know, as a result of nutrients from the landscape, not because of geese, you know, so, so, you know, you've got bacteria and you've got the nutrients causing things like the blue-green algae blooms, that's your, you know, your microcystin, your toxin, etc. Is that a huge, huge deal? Probably not. I mean, people make a big deal of it, but it's like, to me, it's like, you know, you could probably get cancer from strawberry pop, right? If you drank a whole bunch of it, you'd probably have to drink 250 cases a day. The problem is you can't, you know, you'd die of water poisoning before you ever died of, of cancer, I guess is what I'm saying. So blue green algae, am I saying go out and drink it and swim in it and blah, blah, blah. No, but I'm saying that, you know, the risk of any serious health effects are probably minimal. Now it can cause irritation and itching. And then also what I've seen is if you know that blue green algae is there, a lot of people all of a sudden start to have <laughs> symptoms, you know what I mean? So, but, but that being said, now blue green algae can, can cause those sort of issues for real. And, you know, pets, if they ingest a lot of that water, they're a lot smaller than we are. It can be an issue. It can be sickness or even death in some cases. So, but now just because there's a beach warning doesn't mean every area in Lake Darling is laden with toxic algae either. You know, it might just be this little place here and then it moves because the wind blows it over here, you know, and then it blows it over here. So, um, yeah, some other things on there. Bank slope, when you're building a pond, Typically you want your banks about three to one. So in other words, you want to get from, you know, the, the pond, uh, the edge of the pond to deep water fairly quickly, if that makes sense. You don't want, you know, to be able to walk 20 feet out in a foot or two of water. That's, you know, where you have two feet depth, you know, the sunlight's going to hit the bottom and where it's the bottom and we've got lots of nutrients, we're going to get plant growth growing up in those areas. So the more shallow areas you got, more vegetation that you could potentially have. So if you consider that you want to get to deep water pretty quick, that's a good way to kind of avoid vegetation problems and protect the health of your pond long term. Now, uh, and this might be hard, you know, in our state, but obviously um, row crop in your watershed that we talked about isn't greatly desired. So if you've got a uh, row crop right up to the edge of your pond, then you're probably going to have sedimentation and nutrients. That's just a fact, you know. Um, same deal though, if you build a pond in a new subdivision and there's lots of construction going on for 10 years, <laughs> you're going to have the same problem. 
And in a new subdivision, people plant grass and they fertilize it, right? Same sort of issue. So, you know, urban situations can be just as bad. They're both going to contribute silt and nutrients. And you know, obviously fish populations are drastically reduced when you get sedimentation and nutrient problems that can cause issues uh, via, you know, disruptions to the food chain because site feeding fish can't see or decomposing vegetation that results in low oxygen conditions. So ponds can be used for livestock watering. That's something people may not be completely familiar with by running a small uh, pipe, you know, through the dam and then feeding the cattle behind. And the reason we do that is so the cattle aren't on the banks of the pond, stomping the banks of the pond, making them very loose because you get wind and wave action that's working on loose material. It's going to break it down and contribute sedimentation and turbidity to the pond, if that makes Here's sense. Kind of a weird sure. If, let's say you're going to draw that water off the bottom of the pond as unoxygenated. Does that matter to that cow? No. Okay. Yeah. No. Nope. I didn't yeah. know. I mean. Yep. And actually, I think if we go back there, the other than it's kind of stagnant water, you see where the pipe mm -hmm. originates is more up in that oxygenated layer. The, the south, it seems like they do a lot more big drops yep. and then out where then the Midwest, yeah. where we're up a little higher. Yeah. yeah. No, I think water is water, you know, and it's not like they're getting any benefit of oxygen out of it because they can breathe there, you know, I mean, so you're good in that respect, but it'd be like us drinking tap water that we left on the counter for three days. It'd probably tastes terrible, you know. So. Well, I too, if, if their system is a better system, we just don't pay for it. Because when we built our pond, mm -hmm. I thought about doing that. Yeah. It was going to be a lot more expensive. Right. And we had a two foot drain is what we needed for our pond. But uh -huh. I thought it'd be cool to do it that way because I thought it might be a better system. Sure. And then you can screw it down and let the water level out to fix stuff. Yeah, right. Yeah. But I didn't know if that was a, actually a better system that's drawn off the bottom or not. Right, it'd be colder, it'd be colder water, but it would be, I would call it more stagnant water, you know. So then again, it might be, you know, in a lot of people know better than I, you know, the cattle like to drink stagnant water. Like we have rabbits at home, my wife or daughter has a whole herd of rabbits, you know, for 4-H and those darn things are finicky. If they don't like something, they don't eat it. And, you know, early on you'd be saying, well, eventually they'll get hungry or thirsty, they'll eat it. No, they won't they'll starve themselves to death. So if cattle are anyway like that, then there might be a problem with doing <laughs> When we talk about vegetation on the edge of the pond, I mean, we're, we're yep. talking about algae and, yep. and moss and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Then there's other stuff like cattails. Yes, yep. Different kind of vegetation. Yep. I, I think of that veg cattails as good vegetation. Sure. Yeah, and it can be, but it, then it might not be either. It just depends on how much, you know, so but it's it's hard to grow in every pond mm -hmm. uh, some have it and some don't some right have it for a little while and then boom all of a sudden it's gone it's gone yeah yeah this, this buddy of mine that has the perch in the pond right he wants cattails uh, terribly right <laughs> but he can't he had them the first year right for two years in his pond and then they went away and he's sure. blaming all the neighbors for dumping them every time right right yeah I, that's an interesting thing so cattails are an emergent you know so most of their plant material is up above the water you know so it's not like they're not getting sunlight etc they have grass carp in the pond because they would okay i was going to say that's a fish that would kind of pick it you know probably the root you know bases etc could be sedimentation you know uh you know as the plants senesce you know in the fall and winter you know and that above ground stuff goes away and they get buried you know eventually you know i would say the tubers are still there but they're not getting the light that they need to sprout and go you know if there's turtles in the pond i've seen this happen in areas of typically not a problem for a farm pond but a backwater of the illinois river was so abundant with turtles that you know any vegetation that did try to sprout who must be the clock but when it would try to sprout <laughs> then uh basically the turtles would crop it off right away and so anything that was produced never really got a chance so there could be a lot of mechanisms happening like that um, 
things could have changed. You know, who knows? I'm just speculating here, but you know, if there was tree cover and it was removed and it changed wind patterns, maybe the shore gets battered by waves more than it ever did, you know? And it's not conducive for plants to grow there anymore because they're just getting pounded by waves or something all the time. So there's many different little aspects that could be considered, but I'd also say be careful what you wish for, because I mean, if cattails take off bad, <laughs> they can become problematic as well. So stocking program, we don't have one in Iowa anymore. We used to, and it's kind of a bummer that we don't do that anymore, but just kind of consider that we had tied up an entire hatchery for the farm pond program. That was the issue for the entire growing season. So they were producing solely fish for like the private farm pond program. Um, obviously that was kind of a problem because we have a lot of public lakes and ponds and rivers that have to be stocked as well. Um, and it, you know, we were charging only 2675 per acre. That's pretty cheap, right? Dirt cheap, you know? So, um, we weren't really, we were losing money on this deal. You know, it was a service for people. Yeah, so it'd be a okay. thousand bluegills, 70 largemouth bass, and 100 channel cats per acre, you know. So even you had a five acre pond, you're getting a heck of a deal, right? You know? So it's a pretty good deal. And like I said, we weren't making money on it. That was never our intent. We wanted to provide the service. But, you know, as priorities change, and um, we've got some aging infrastructure, you know, in terms of hatcheries and things like that. And so. Where was your Fairport was where all these were produced, yeah. And they still produce those fish, but mainly for public stockings now. And then some are produced over at Mount Air, if you know where that is. Mount Air Fish Hatchery, which is also a management station. It's kind of a half hatchery, half management station. So the, Can you now buy from those two facilities? No, we, <laughs> no, we solely produce fish for public water. So we met with a bunch of private aquaculture producers, say, can you produce a product? similar to what we used to. And those, you know, there's some criteria that they've got to meet, but basically they're certified producers that we kind of approve of. And, and you have to go through their difference now is they might charge you $300 and, you know, so, but, and that's probably more of a normal price. This was pretty darn, darn good. You know what when I mean? So, uh, 15. So okay. it's been gone oh, a little wow. while. I just yeah. missed it we have spent about 5,500 bucks to stock ours. Yes. And we're still not. It, yep. We've had some different. Yeah. The, and the thing is, you've got to, with the private, you know, always, if you're going to restock or stock something, don't hesitate to give us a call, you know, because we're going to shoot you straight on, you know, what's going to work, what not. And I've told you a lot of that tonight, you know, grass carp can be okay, but typically in a lot of situations they're not good, you know, so, and there's things like, you know, walleye, could you stock them when they live? Yes, they might live, but are they really going to provide you any benefit? No, you know, I mean, there's, and, you know, we've gotten some crazy, crazy requests for, you know, fit, well, tilapia, you know, those are really technical, they're illegal to be stocking, you know, in Iowa ponds, but people want to, use them to control like algae and things. But that's the thing, uh, if I had to say anything about your pond is like, think about in a, like kind of a, at a bigger scale when you think about your pond, don't try to control the symptoms, try to control the problem, you know? A lot of times, so we've got bad algae and bad plant growth. We tried to attack it rather than attacking the reason we have it in the first place, if that makes sense. You know, so addressing sedimentation and nutrient loads is more important. Can I ask about my, my own pond? Yes, uh, yep. So it was dug about uh, 14 months ago. Okay. It's in uh, the very northeast corner of Fairfield, just a tiny bit outside the city boundary. Uh huh. Um, it was dug 14 feet deep. Uh, it's maybe three quarters of an acre. It's almost characteristic of uh, what you've been saying. Yes. The, the runoff is probably about three acres, mostly CRP. Land. Good, yep. Um, I, the, the other ag agricultural land runs into an upper pond, yes. which I bypass down into um, Pleasant Lake. Okay. 
So, so my main poem is getting mainly rainwater and a little bit of CRP level. Right, that's good. Clean, cleaner. Yes. It's, it's a very clean poem. I mean, before it froze, I don't think it had any uh, weed in it. Yeah, right. I stopped it back in uh, maybe May yep. with pretty much the same thing. In fact, I may even have talked to you yep. up in Lake Durham. Sure, so yep. many very enthusiastic. Yeah, this is me or Vance, bro. <laughs> so. Yep. Yeah, and um, you know, I'm a complete neophyte. I, I do not. So, so I've got this very clean pond. I was swimming in it really comfortably. Yep. Um, now, of course, it's iced over. Actually, my fish are going to be pets. So I don't. I'm not a fisherman. Yeah. Um, and I'm worried about them because they're under six inches of ice. Are they going to live through the winter? Yes, <laughs> most likely, yeah. Be oh, I got that, and, and I got 11 uh, white in here. Those are grass carp, yeah. Grass carp, yeah. Okay, that's way too many. Way too many, yeah. Oh. So, technically by our stocking ratios, you should have three quarters of a grass carp, but that is impossible, so you need one. Just one? Just one, okay. yep. So, um, well, are they going to die then? Because there's not enough, there's no weed. Yeah, possibly if you have no ve vegetation, they might starve to death, you know what I mean? But the reason you might be just totally devoid of any of that, they're going to focus on eating submerged rooted aquatics primarily. So like algaes and things, grass carp don't really eat that stuff. Um, that's not their preferred food source, but they'll find any rooted plants, like we call it seaweed, you know, you might heard that term a lot. They'll find that and crop it all off. Now, you know, they're not very good at, at digesting that material, so there's a lot of waste, and so they excrete a lot of nutrients back into the pond, and those nutrients are typically taken up first by algae and things, which could give your pond a green cast. That's why 13 is, you know, way too many for that small of a pond, because they're going to be very effective at finding any rooted material and eating it, period, you know. Um, so, yes. Yep. And fish, food. and it's it's fine. It's fine as long as there's not a lot of waste. So whatever you feed, you know, you probably just kind of give a good, you know, observe really well. I guess is what I'm saying, and make sure that what you're feeding is being consumed and not just wasted and sinking to the bottom. Yep. Um, there was no fish coming to the surface. Sure. They yeah, they dormant. That's it. And that's probably a reflection of the, the cold. You know, they're going to get more lethargic and dormant as temperatures drop, you know. So I, my guess is you get back to June and we start getting some warm weather and all of a sudden the water starts warming up and you feed, you'll see those fish again. But yeah, 13 grass carp is a lot, and it could cause you issues if if you have vegetation that they can impact, if you never had it to begin well, with. There is a little bit of grass that yes. grows out of the edges of the pond. It's quite steep. Right. Down to the depth. And I often saw what looked like something nibbling at that. Sure, that's probably grass carp. Yep. Okay. Yep, yep. So, interesting little experiment, you know, if you're mowing your grass and Spray some of the grass into the water and see if the grass can come up and try to eat. Seriously, they would. They would yeah. <laughs> so, okay, yeah. So it's okay to put mowed grass into the water. Well, I, you know, I'm not necessarily recommending that. I just think it'd oh, be a, okay. yeah, <laughs> a neat experiment, you know. Uh, and I've heard a lot of people talk about that as they're mowing the grass and their overstocked pond full of grass carp. All those grass carp will come up and feed on that material especially where they've impacted it so badly they don't have a lot to eat, you know, I mean, that's the sort of observations you see. Um, potential problems with that many, you know, or, you know, we could have two things happen. They don't survive because they don't get enough to eat or enough grows that it sustains them and you have 13 grass carp and they end up excreting a lot of those nutrients. All of a sudden your pond turns from nice clear water to pea green over time and now you just have this algae laden pond that's very turbid 
and that's going to impact your whole fish community for that matter. Um, so, you know, I mean, they're getting rid of grass carp is difficult once they're in there. You got to catch them. I heard they're very small. Yes, and well, Missouri, they actually recommend fishing for grass carp with a cherry tomato on the end of a hook. I think it's the goofiest <laughs> thing I've ever heard. I don't know how it would work, but they actually, their extension office puts out a publication telling you how to do that, you know, so there is a possibility that, you know, I mean, it's a, a fruit, I suppose they would bite on it eventually and you can catch would some that, out. Would that sink down or would you try to surf yeah, it? Yeah, it looks like they, you know, sink it in a shallow area and they come up and feed on it and oh. apparently get hooked. You know, just go on the Missouri Department of Conservation, you know, grass carp removal and you might be able to find that publication. Uh, a lot of people will blow fish, so they'll use the grass mowed grass technique and when they come up, you know, bow fish and remove them one by one. And that's a way to kind of reduce that number back down quickly, you know, if you're a good shot anyway, <laughs> to get rid of them. Um, but yeah, they could, they could cause you trouble. I wouldn't panic yet, but just kind of keep an eye on that sort of situation. But I think your fish will be fine and they will survive the ice as long as we don't have a really severe winter like we had these sort of temperatures extending into late winter uh, we had really thick ice and then we get heavy snow on top so far we've gotten snow and then it's melted quite a bit right i mean so then that's okay you know but if we go through periods where we get you know whatever let's say 10 inches of snow or more yeah, and it never, yeah, exactly, and it never melts, and we keep getting more on top of that, and we, you know, a little bit of snow, some light can still get through, we build more snow, less light, and more and more, nothing. Should I be doing a hole in the ice? For it probably wouldn't help, you know, you'd have to create a, you'd have to have a chainsaw and open up a pretty darn big hole, you know. You'd, you'd be better at it with, in a three-quarter acre pond, making a hole big enough that it would impact the pond versus something like a five acre pond. You cut the same size hole on the five acre pond, it probably wouldn't do anything. It freezes. Yeah. Pretty fast. yeah, and it would freeze too. Yep. Yeah. I, I also seem to have better muskrats. Oh, yes. Yeah. Now, my dad is very slow, mm -hmm. slow to the back. Sure. It slopes right down to Pleasant Lake at the front of the like this. So they have a heck of a way to get all the way through to the back of the dam, but still, should I attempt to catch them and transfer them into Yes. Uh, <laughs> well, don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Now that caused a bunch of issues. Uh, you know, you probably have an officer visit you then. We don't want that. You know, but catching them on the other hand and removing them, if they're causing damage, invisible damage, you know, to the dam, or you know banks and that sort of thing they can probably cause a lot of issue in a small pond like that you know and it would it wouldn't be with the fish community you know not like eating things and causing disruptions in that way but they can severely damage shorelines and pond dams and things and cause you structural issues yeah yeah yep. my when the bulldozer guys were doing it yep one of the guys probably said we've got about four times as much dirt on the back of that dam. Yeah. And, and so that really you know, cost me a lot to get down to do this and then slow down really yeah. slow. I don't know. They might be able to dig three or four feet into the dam. And they yeah. will more than likely go all the way through. Right. I mean, they're not going to work that hard. If this is the water surface, here's your dam. Yep. You're just going to tunnel through. And when trees start growing there, they'll use It'll just loosen that dam up. Yeah. You probably don't have a big concern, but in all honesty, yeah. you need to get somebody with some one hand conveyor traps and just catch them in. Yep. When you do that, they're gone. They're dead. Right. But yep. you might not like it. Oh, they're so cute. And they are cute. Yeah. I mean, they're really There's fun. always another one that's cute. Right. <laughs> well, see, you're probably getting muskrats off number two pond. Then. Okay. You're probably getting these muskrats off oh, Pleasant off. Lake, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, they probably come out from Pleasant yep. Lake because they are right. the exclusive. It's a brand new area. And like we was getting otters right. and ours off the of Skunk River, which or Skunk Cedar Creek, excuse me, uh, get in the wrong area. Uh, they got here here. Um, but anyway, yeah, they'll travel quite a ways to get some new yes. areas. Right.
Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned otters because that's the other one that we see a lot. People call in and say, I've got otters. They're going to destroy my whole pond. Probably not. Will they catch some fish and utilize them? Absolutely. But usually otters are uh, uh, an animal that will kind of take their fill. And then, you know, as numbers start to decline, they move on, you know. And on that, what I've heard, I used to trap a lot when I was a kid and in the, my 20s. But an otter will take that fish a lot of times and take it down to the pond dam and eat it there, crap there. Yep. And then that's one indicator of you have otters. That's from Joe Adams. Yeah. That's a guy around here that chops a lot. Yep. Uh, I've not ever caught an otter. I've caught beaver and coon. Yeah. They'll tend to go back to the same place and create what's called a midden, you know, so you'll find all kinds of carcasses, mussel shells, you know, all stacked up. That's otter activity, you know. A lot of times, too, otters will be seen in the spring, early summer, I think when they have young, so they'll be inhabiting your pond, and as the young grow, they move on, you know. So, yeah, right. Now, an otter cannot catch every fish in your pond. Could they impact, like, the population? Probably, in a, they could change the dynamic of things you know what i mean they could reduce numbers and re, you know change size classes but they're never going to catch every fish in the pond you know that's impossible you know so yeah be, well be, beaver yeah yeah they've caused us trouble in terms of sealing up your drain pipe or impacting the flow out of your your drain pipe for your pond They'll build a lot of, you know, woody material up in front of that and clog some of those sometimes, you know. So, and that can be a dangerous thing because you just can't go down there and pull that out. You'll get sucked right, you know, that will kill you, you know. So, you know, yes, you, if you try to, yeah, but you'll be amazed how, you know, when that lets loose and starts going through, yeah. You'll get pinned up against it, and the next thing you know, you'll be gone. So don't, <laughs> don't try to do something like that. We do. Yeah. That yeah. My, well, my son and I, and uh, her brother, uh, and it, it took the whole boat in. His divots pawn out north of town, and I had no idea. Right. That it was that. Dangerous. Oh, dangerous. We couldn't get out. Yeah. I think people have drowned in road culverts, you know, trying to free those up. So it's a big deal, yeah. So you don't want beaver activity, you know. And again, if you had beaver activity in and around your pond, it probably hire a trapper to remove them. Yep. They're going to cause you problems. Go ahead. Going back to this yep. slide, you got uh, one to two inch bluegills and then one to two inch large rock bass. Yep. Can you your recommendation, I think, is to stock them about a year apart, isn't it? Yes, it is. So now, I guess what I'm thinking is stock, and I, or what I hear from people is use larger bass, with the idea that they're going to control the bluegills that have been established. Right. But now with the stock them in the same size category. Yep. Separated by season, so these would typically go in in fall, right? And, and the idea is so get bluegills established at that size they'll go in typically in October they'll grow a little bit before winter and then come early spring you know they'll kind of grow a little bit more they only have to be about three inches or so to reach sexual maturity in a lot of cases you know you get some hitting maturity that early and certainly by the time you get up four or five inches you got all kinds of mature fish so they'll spawn in June of that following year and that's usually when the largemouth bass then are stocked. So essentially what you're doing is that first year class of um, bluegill that you stocked are producing the second year class which the largemouth bass are feeding on when they hit the water. You know, so then those largemouth bass feed on the young produced by that bluegill and then grow very rapidly as well. And they're not going to really be, you know, bluegills aren't going around eating bass. That's really not what they eat. They're eating aquatic insects, you know, plankton, you know, etc. You know, large macro invertebrates, that sort of thing, and not really necessarily feeding on your largemouth bass. And then channel cats, we usually stock oh, about the same time as largemouth bass in, in June. Honestly, it really doesn't matter. You could stock them and fall on the bluegills. But Is that that very large fish at the bottom of the black one? Yeah, that's a channel catfish, a little bit bigger one. Yep. So, how, how large could a bluegill get to be? 
sports really not be on somebody's dinner table? Oh, I, you know, I've never seen too many bluegills bigger than 10 inches, you know, so. You know, I, I mean, yeah. I mean, a bass is oh, big. yeah, yeah. Yeah, gape size kind of depends on the size of the bass, but, you know, five, six inches, they're probably getting pretty big then to be consumed by a bass, yeah. So to, to stock a new pond by right, something you catch out of an old pond, and, yes. and they're four or five inches. Right. That you may get overkill. Yeah, I mean, they can reproduce so heavily. They can reproduce so heavily, but yeah, in that case, you know, um, you, say you went the route of just stocking adults, you know, generally around whatever. Say you put them in October, they're going to spawn. Uh, probably not that fall. They could sometimes bluegill. You know, they'll spawn multiple times a year, but if they do produce your class that late, it'd be really small but come june they're going to produce a pretty big year class and so you know you want to coincide that spawning event with that stocking of bass right away and i think they would be on top of them now if you left the bluegill in there and waited an entire year calendar year before you stock the bass you probably have an issue because all the young that they produce you know except for those that succumb to some environmental issue or something are going to survive you're going to get high survival and then you're going to populate that pond with lots and lots of bluegill, add the bass later. You're going to have more that have escaped predation, and, and you're just kind of going to run into this vicious cycle, I think is what you're kind of thinking about here. Yeah, so timing is very important. I usually don't recommend stocking adults because uh, kind of the reason you're saying you can get ahead of yourself before you ever really, you know, get that pond established. That's often why we do fingerling, you know. They start out young, you've got some time to kind of get everything in balance, so to speak, and let it develop on its own. And they've all developed together, they're controlling and working in a unified fashion. And you, do, you end up with a balanced pond, so to speak. You've heard that term balance, you know. I mean, that's kind of a very generic term, but that's your goal. And in fact, I think, we're talking about some of that timing, you know, in the next slide. So um, you saw the numbers there. Those were the fingerlings that we used to stock through the farm pond program. They were a little smaller. You go to private aquaculturists nowadays, and they're going to give you a little bit larger product. And that's okay. But you'll notice the numbers are reduced from what we used to recommend, right? And that's because the bigger you are, the more likely you are to survive. That's just a fact. You know, if you're small, you're fragile, you know, uh, you're more susceptible to predation. So that's why we're able to reduce numbers if you stock a larger product. So I've got juvenile um, stocking rates at those larger sizes. That's generally what you're going to get from a private aquaculturist nowadays. That's what they've told us they can provide you. And then if you went the adult route, like you were suggesting, this is what it would be um you know i don't list anything for adults for catfish because you know you're getting them at four to six inches anyway and, and they're getting kind of up there they're not going to be susceptible to predation you can still stock juveniles four to six inches along with your adult bluegill and bass and do it you could do that i don't know if i necessarily recommend it because as you already pointed out you know if you do have a glorious spawning event you could set yourself back right off the bat you know if you've got sexually mature fish producing tons of young right away that could be problematic so we did uh ours is the shy six acres yep. so we did 600 catfish the catfish 600 bass yep. red ear and normal bluegill Okay. But it seemed like the catfish just flourished way too much. Yep. Was they eating a lot of our good stuff? Um, potentially. The, the bigger thing is that they have a lot of habitat and interstitial spaces to inhabit, to escape predation, you yeah, know? We had 70 culverts. Uh, yeah. Yep. 50. Come on. Yeah. yeah. We have a lot of so it sounds like to me that you it's gave sure. them prime habitat. You know, they're going to be a cavity spawner, you know? Um, so they're going to inhabit those culverts and those interstitial spaces. And then, you know, the, the male catfish protects that school of young that's produced pretty aggressively. And so, you know, they're going to protect those young, make sure they don't get preyed upon. And a lot of that school is going to survive. And that may be why you're getting increasing numbers. And you've given lots of 
habitat for those catfish to be successful. Well, and we've taken yeah. most, most of them out. Right. Because we got nervous that it's like our bass numbers. Yeah. Do you think it'd be worth shocking upon after five or six years, have paying somebody to do it? Yeah, and there are people that do it. There's a gentleman up in Cedar Rapids that would do it and kind of give you an idea, you know, what is going on in there and how healthy, you know, the community and populations are. Yeah, I mean, if that's something that, you know, would, would kind of give you peace of mind as to knowing how it's going. Um, catfish, honestly, though, that problem could be fixed easily. So annually, they experience about 30%, you know, uh, mortality. Yeah. You know, and that's harvest mortality and then just natural mortality combined. Now, harvest, I mean, that depends on how hard you fish it, how many people you let fish, etc. So if that's low, then, you know, it's going to be less than 30%. But the point is that, you know, you left them, you know, even if it was 20% mortality because you didn't have a lot of harvest, you know, you leave that go for five, six years and your population is going to be reduced to next to nothing. You know what I mean? So that's why we recommend maintenance stocking a catfish every other year. Yeah. So, and that's, that's one place where you could help yourself too. So we recommend every other year, you know, after that initial stocking a catfish, you come back and you stock a hundred per acre again. again. But with the caveat, if there's very little harvest, you know, um, don't overdo it. Maybe you don't need to do the 100. Maybe you can reduce that to 50 or 25. Or if it make you feel more comfortable, don't do it every other year. Do it every third year, every fourth year. But the point is, you know, if you don't do it ever, then your catfish population eventually, you know, you'll have some large adults in there that'll be massive, but you're not going to have a very big population. And eventually when they succumb to natural mortality, you won't have any. Yeah. Yeah. So I say 100, you know, 100 per acre to start. And then, you know, so basically if you don't have very many now, stock the 100 per acre if you want them. And then don't get crazy about stocking them every other year because you knew you had plenty of habitat in the past. They're having successful natural reproduction, you know, and that's because they have lots of places to hide. Normally, the bass would just crop off that entire school because they're very exposed, yeah. right? So. Well, we ended up uh, probably taking a shy hundred out. Yeah. And there's all three pounds. Yeah, hey, no, that's fine. How yeah. Did you get those out? Fishing. Yeah. <laughs> well, fishing. Ask her. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 And oh. shrimp and, and they had a blast. Yeah. No, oh, that sounds fun. Yep, but. No, I mean, uh, yeah, I think the issue would be just knowing that you have plenty of habitat, you're going to have successful reproduction, back off on the maintenance stocking. And you wouldn't want to get those catfish out of Cedar Creek, would you? You can. I mean, you're talking like going out, catching them hook and line, or yeah. at least you I could. Don't know if that would be yep. bringing a disease or something. Potentially, you know, I mean, you could, but, yeah. you know, you could probably bring in a disease from an aquaculture culture unit too, well, you that's know. that's one thing that... Yeah. Uh, uh, Lazo is like we guarantee we don't have any disease with mm. any of our fish but how do you know how do you know yeah I mean you'd have to be testing for everything and there's multiple parasites diseases etc that you could be we'll talk about one of the I mean grubs I mean you could well a great blue heron could land in your pond and give you oh, grubs. Yeah. you know what I mean so I mean that's that's all you need so um, or you know, you get some fish with some water that happens to have snails in it and you don't see the snails and you dump it in. The snails could be carrying, you know, the the parasite because they're a host, you know. So that's another way oh, you could get, they're a host for the black grub, well, you know, so. Do you have a picture of a normal bluegill and a red ear? Because I got, we, we, we just catch that, I don't know yeah. if it's. Let's well, see, here's a bluegill. Okay, usually orange or yellow breasts, you know, vertical bands on it. Everybody's kind of seen a bluegill. And then a red ear, similar looking, but a little bit different. You know, it's not so orange right up here under the head, maybe a little yellow coloration on the belly. Um, it has vertical bands, but the biggest difference would be hard to see on here, but that ear flap you see on the operculum or gill cover, it's gonna have a bright red swash. So on like it. that's a normal one. 
That's a bluegill. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But now those are the red ears called bluegill too, or no? Red ears are red ears. So. Oh, they're strictly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Down south, south, you might hear them called shellcracker. Okay. You ever heard that term? Oh, I have. Yeah, yeah shellcracker. Well, but down south they call everything brim. I think you know what I mean, and that's a generic term for any sunfish. But oh. shellcracker would be the southern term for red ear sunfish. Oh, okay. Red ear sunfish typically they're less reproductively capable so they produce less young yeah that's a good picture I think this yeah is you. yeah okay yeah uh, that looks like that one pretty much but yeah um okay. so here's your red swath okay see that different oh yeah yeah mm -hmm. and personally when i've seen them in the wild red ears are i mean they can have bands and i would say that's more typical of a young red ear sunfish as they get larger they almost get bronze color huh. yeah darker bronze and like a spawning male almost black but the one characteristic that'll stick out like a sore thumb is that bright red ear flap and then i kind of think too bluegills tend to be deeper from top to bottom mm -hmm. where these aren't quite as deep and you can see that a little bit maybe it's it's a tough comparison but yeah these are more streamlined mm -hmm. oh, yeah, you yeah. Hook on that. yeah whereas this is deeper and i think if you get two fairly large specimens you'd see that pretty good in the wild but yep you bet so red ears though you know they're going to be stocked at about half the rate of bluegills uh, they're about half as reproductive to be honest so you won't see them quite as often but they will reach larger sizes like i said the bluegill made about 10 inches max red ear could be 12 inches i've seen them 12 inches in a pound and a half which is quite a bit bigger than you know your biggest bluegill for that matter um, crappies again you want a 10 acre plus pond uh, ideally probably wait a good year if not two years after you get like your bluegills your bass your catfish established before you come back and put those in again kind of alluding to what you said you don't if you put them in right away right off the bat they'd have a glorious spawn especially if there was no predation you're already set yourself back you know you're going to throw bass in there and they'll have so much to eat they're going to be fat and happy for a while until they get full and can't control them any more than everything takes a nosedive. So. How does that deal work where you know, I've heard you, you can have X number of pounds of fish whether they're big fish yes. or small fish. How, how does that balance? How does that balance out? Well, I mean, I don't remember the numbers offhand, but definitely we could look at those since I've got some publications. but. You know, basically it works like this. It's really dependent upon uh, reproductive capability, fecundity. You ever hear that term? It just re means reproductively capable. You know, how capable are they at producing young? Bluegills, um, 35 to 50,000 young per female. Crappies, as I mentioned, 350,000 per female. Okay, red ears, about half of what bluegill are so we're probably getting down 20,000 you know uh, 20 25,000 eggs per female um, catfish you know they're going to be you know per, quite a bit lower uh, fecundity or reproductive capability than like your sunfish species for sure they reproduce in a pond they invest a lot of time in guarding their young and where you don't have habitat you know the young are very susceptible to predation Thus, we have to maintenance stock in order to keep that population going. Um, and see, so largemouth bass was the other species. Um, they are not going to be very fecund, you know. Uh, so essentially, they're not producing very many young, quite a bit less than your bluegill and even your red ear. Um, but obviously, you know, they're kind of your top line predator feeding on all these other fish that. So, you know, it's kind of evolutionary in that sense. These have evolved as prey. Red ears really prey. Um, these are, best way to say it is garbage people, you know. Somebody's got to clean up the mess. That's the channel cat, you know, but you don't need super high numbers, but you need enough to do the job sort of thing. So how it translates to pounds is really dependent upon uh, how many young are being produced and survive from year to year it's all proportional i guess is what i'm getting at you know so in the end 
how would it stack out? Well, um, if you had a big pond, you know, I would say that in terms of, you know, what proportion might have the most pond, uh, pounds, it would be your black crappies and your bluegill, right? Red ears aren't as reproductively capable, that's gonna rank less. And then probably on the bottom, your channel catfish and uh, your bass. Now, pond's out of balance, so we talked about that. You know, if you had, uh, let's just easy example, same number of pounds of bass in the pond as bluegill in the pond, and I'd be worried about that situation because now you got a prey problem, you know? Probably not enough. Ideally, you'd want them to, you know, the bluegill to be way more numerous than the bass, if that makes sense. Will the bass feed on each other or not? They will, yeah, if they have to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I wouldn't even, you know, I mean, you're obviously not now. It might be a proportional thing again. Um, they're going to encounter a bluegill more often, so they're primarily eating bluegill and red ears, right? Yeah. But if there's no bluegill around and there's a little bass there, they're going to eat you, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So I don't think it's like... There's no thought process that I'm cannibalizing my own. It's just proportional. Yeah. They're what's ever easiest to find. Is plankton, a, it's a part of that though too, right? For a younger fish, yep. To establish the food chain. Yes, the yep, yep. So any sport fish at some point in their life, usually early, is going to need plankton. And when a, so right out of the egg, they're called larvae or larval fish. They've got to find plankton to eat. If they cannot find that plankton, they die very quickly. And that's the end of their life before it even really started. So, like, good example, when we stock walleye, you know, we do it annually, every year, you know, in ponds across Iowa. And we'll stock millions of larval walleye in a particular water body, right? We know that once every five years, that stocking was successful. Why wasn't it successful the other four? Because the timing wasn't quite right. There wasn't a plankton base for them to find same time. But you know, problem for us is the walleyes are ready when they're ready, right? We, you know, the adults spawn, we have to go catch them. We have to get the eggs. We have to fertilize the eggs and produce them. And once they're produced, we got to get them out of the hatchery. We can't hold them forever, right? We can't hold them very long at all. So we go out and we stock them. Well, we might have missed the plankton boom, you know. So just the odds are that once every five years we hit it right on the head. And that's enough to sustain fishing for years, you know, so. Uh, is there any reason to be putting any kind of pond weed in one's new pond? I, I wouldn't, I don't think you have to go plant, you know, aquatic plants on your own. They're going to get there most likely. Um, what we've seen is people build a new pond, you're gonna get waterfowl and things coming in. And I would say that would be a source, not that they're carrying it, but they probably consumed it, right? And a lot of the seeds for that stuff, you know, they have to go through the gut to be able to germinate anyway. So they're excreted and, you know, plant themselves and then you get uh, things growing um, in your pond, you know, plants of all kinds, but. Water yes, yeah, worst one. yeah. Yeah, so I would say like stuff like he's talking about, don't go to the pawn store and buy stuff like that because usually what they have are tropical plants, you know, um, and a lot of those unfortunately will survive and they cause all kinds of trouble, especially if they're released from your pond and get into a public water body, we can have issues. Uh, I noticed in the uh, north end of Bonifield Lake, mm -hmm. years back, there was a huge growth of curly leafed pond. Curly leaf pond weed, yeah. I yeah. actually reported it to the council. Yep. They didn't seem to. They didn't care have too much. Reaction. Yeah. I know that there's, there's it is an it's an invasive and it's an. Yeah. Curly leaf pond weed, yeah, and that's spread around again by probably waterfowl, and the other source would be boats boat traffic so that's why we have AIS techs that come and check you at ramps what they're really doing is looking and see if you got vegetation on your trailer you know on your boat if you got water in your bilge to try to prevent you from then going to the next water body and because people do that they'll hop out of one lake and go to the other because this one didn't have good fishing that day and they'll spread it around so if I could take 10 of my 11 um, yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pond, yep. put them 
Yeah. Would that help? Well, the officer would probably show up at your house again, so don't <laughs> do that. <laughs> so, yeah, but would they control the curly leaf pondweed? Yeah, they well, probably, the, I mean, yeah, they would eat it. Yeah. They would definitely eat it. Would seem to be afraid of yep. grass carp right. for some reason. Yeah. They don't reproduce? Theoretically, you know. Okay. Have you ever seen the movie Jurassic Park? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If anything you can gather from that that's truth is life finds a way, you know what I mean? And that's an accurate statement. So um, what we found is uh, they're supposed to be triploid, except when they leave the place that supposedly produced them is all triploid, they don't check everyone. You know, there is no, you know, checking of that whatsoever. So diploids make it out and then we, you know, we're not, I can tell you, I did a rote known study, if you're familiar with rote known, it's fish toxicant. We'd block off quarter acre sections of backwaters on the Mississippi River and we'd treat it with rote known and we'd neutralize it with an antidote on the outside called potassium permanganate. So we were minimizing kill outside the block net. One particular area in the Mississippi River, it was thousands upon thousands upon thousands of grass carp that big. So, you know, they weren't, you know, there wasn't a grass carp truck that just fell, you know, off the road and dumped them all in the, those were produced in the river system. So, the the big, yes, sure. yeah, grass carp, I think I got a picture, we get going here, but let's see what's next. Okay, it's going to be up the road, but yeah, so um, grass carp, um, they're different. They primarily focus on eating vegetation. Okay, and whereas, you know, the Asian carps are primarily focused on eating plankton, whether it be um, phytoplankton, filamentous algae, or zooplankton, they'll eat both. They're a filter feeder. They actually open their mouth and ram against the water. They call it ram feeding. So they're pushing a bunch of water over their gills and their gill rakers are filtering out that plankton, you know, whether it be plant or animal, and then they consume it. So, or grass carp is gonna be targeting rooted vegetation and breaking it off and consuming it and, you know, getting 10% of the energy and excreting the rest back into the environment is other plants. <laughs> you know, so anyway, hybrid sunfish, it's a no-no, don't stock them. Uh, they're not completely sterile, so they reproduce, but their reproductive output's greatly reduced. Um, problem is, like, if that were the only um, prey base you had in the pond, they cannot through reproduction, sustain the prey demands of bass. And so you're gonna end up with stunted bass. Since these aren't uh, completely sterile, they'll back cross, you know, so you take a hybrid that, you know, breeds with another hybrid, they back cross again, and then, you know, this sort of situation, and that's a camera trick, by the way, you know. I know this one really well. You know, if I get a fish and I hold it out like this, it looks huge, but you know, if you pull it back, you can, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so there's not as big as it looks, but it's, it's still a good fish. Don't get me wrong. But when you see them like this, it's usually a first generation hybrid, usually between a bluegill and a green sunfish. That first generation uh, can exhibit some hybrid vigor and be pretty big like that. But then when they back cross, they lose that and they back cross again, they lose a little more. And eventually you got fish that are small, stunted, green sunfish looking, you know, fish and nobody wants those. Then they call us and say, that's all I got is millions of these fish about that long. What do I do? How Apply rotenone. Legal to sell them for majors? Yeah, good question. Um, they are, they are a hybrid of native fish species and I guess that's the only reason that they are. And you know, people have stocked them in combination with native bluegill, but I think it's kind of a waste too. I mean, it doesn't necessarily cause a ton of harm, especially if the hybrids are stocked in a very small proportion as compared to the adult bluegills. But then what's gonna happen is they're gonna just hybridize with the bluegills and kind of lose you know, the hybrid vigor and really transition back to a bluegill again at some point, you know, many generations down the line. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, if it was tilapia, it'd be an easy question to answer because, you know, tilapia are South American, so we don't allow that here, you know, that sort of thing. But since they're spawned from native stock so far, you know, it's great. Um, but they can ruin ponds. 
you know, especially if people are uh, relying on them to support, you know, the bass, they really won't do it. And the ponds that are successful usually have these with bluegill and, you know, five, ten years down the road, it's pretty much going to be kind of maybe a little bit funny looking bluegill, but they're going to exhibit more bluegill characteristic, you know, so. But if you stock this right off the bat, a lot of people really complain that the pond kind of goes to pot very quickly as a result of that. But now a lot of the private hatcheries will try to sell you these and, and really kind of tout the fact they're like pure stream bluegill, that they're really not. So you got to be careful of that. When you stock a pond, when I gave you bluegill recommendations, it's pure stream bluegill, period. That's what you want, not hybrids whatsoever. So how quickly do they grow? So these are back to those smaller numbers, but I mean, it still gives you a pretty good indication. One to two inch bluegill, you know, after a year can be five inches in our area of the state. You know, that's pretty fast growth. Largemouth bass stocked at one to two inches after a year can be up to 10 and a half already. I mean, they grow very fast. You know, that's evolutionary you know obviously the faster you grow the bigger you get the less likely someone is to eat you right so channel catfish it <coughs> excuse me two to three inches can be eight inches you know by a year and you can see how quickly a lot of these grow but like a largemouth bass going to reach legal size in about four years and that's typically what we see um, bluegill about seven and a half although I can tell you that we see faster growth rates especially in in southeast Iowa we have very nutrient rich ponds and warm ponds you know so warm waters conducive to growth uh, good growth and, and we do see that so I would say and sometimes in five years we might surpass eight inches we might be up in the nines and even tens in some cases so but anyway that gives you an idea you know, I guess gather from this that after about two years, you're catching bluegills pretty handily. You're probably catching bass. They may not be the size you want yet, but they're not too shabby. And you're catching probably eater size catfish in two years. By three, you're definitely, you know, able to take a lot of fish to the table. And after four, you're catching legal bass, you know, already. So you haven't talked about habitat. Mm, I will. Oh. Yep. <laughs> but I have that in here actually. So. Harvesting fish from your pond, bluegill, you can start harvesting them second year, uh, channel catfish, three years. You know, so based on some of those growth charts that I showed you, that's where that is, uh, it comes into play. We talked about 30% annual mortality, so needing to stock these periodically. You know, your 100 is a maximum, 100 per acre is a max. You can modify it. Don't go above it, but you can certainly go less or none but you will have to stock them at some sort of periodicity to maintain that population or they'll disappear. Like you're on that. Yep. So we've never caught smaller cats mm -hmm. and we have a lot of habitat for it, but is that surprising? That you haven't caught in small, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, it, obviously you're producing them, but you've never caught, uh, you know, you felt like your numbers were sky high of juveniles or adults well, or what? We have a lot of, yeah. Like I say, it's three pounders out early, so right. we kind of took out a lot of the broods right. out. Yeah, well, then that could affect why you're not seeing the small ones then. Yeah. <laughs> took too many, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so of, of the species we talked about, you know, and again, this relates to the proportion or number of pounds, is, you know, given kind of the scenarios that I posed, what species would be most susceptible to being impacted by harvest? channel cats and largemouth bass, right? You know, ones that don't have very high reproductive capability. Thus, you know, we have limits on them, right? You know, at public lakes, 15 inches. Why? Because at 12 inches, they become reproductively capable. So we're giving them some time, you know, to be uh, essentially repro uh, reproducing, you know, before they're susceptible to being harvested. Um, catfish, there's bag limits, so you're not taking too many. You know, at any single time, you have to work at it. Can't reduce their numbers very quick. So bass, oh uh, yeah, for a pond, that's probably important. Because of the things I talked about, no more than 15 bass per acre over 14 inches in length should be removed annually. So you can take bass, but you should kind of limit your take. You know, so definitely don't take more than 15 bass per acre over 14 inches in length annually. 
long as you abide by that and that means not just you but everybody a lot of fish so keeping track of what kind of bass harvest and maybe even what kind of catfish harvest kind of gives you an idea then how often you should be maintenance stocking bass you don't need to maintenance stock but you need to limit the harvest so they can reproduce on their own we kind of talked about the fish parasite so you know here's a good example of a of a fish that has black grubs, kind of white flesh with salt and, you know, kind of pepper flakes in it. That's black grubs, whereas yellow grubs are going to look very similar, but they're more of a yellow whitish color. But essentially, um, you know, it kind of starts in this cycle somewhere, but, you know, just for the sake of the chart, we start with the blue heron or flukes, um, flatworm, uh, inhabit the throat of the heron so the herons consumed a fish that was infected probably with grubs the adult flukes develop and they they kind of latch on to the throat you know and then they produce eggs the eggs are usually excreted by the bird through urine or feces into the environment eggs hatch uh, into Mer mercidia i think is what they call them which is this little tiny black grub larvae they go and they inhabit a snail so that's, you know, that's an important thing. Like if you're trying to control black grubs, you know, having something that eats snails like a shell cracker, yeah. you know, red ear, would interrupt that, you know, uh, life cycle and over time reduce the number of black and yellow grubs that are inhabiting the fish. So they're a useful tool in that respect. They're not eating the same things necessarily, a few of the same things, but primarily eating snails where the bluegill is eating macroinvertebrates so they don't affect each other but definitely red ears that impact those then they're released from the snail you know and they go to the fish and then basically the fish is eaten by the heron and we just repeat that cycle on over and over again so if you're trying to control grubs you have to interrupt the life cycle fish and wildlife service really doesn't want you shooting blue heron so you can't do that you know so, um, you can obviously catch bluegills but you know your best bet really in this cycle is to get rid of snails how can you get rid of snails red ears and then also snails usually inhabit plant life so if you've got a lot of plant life means you probably got a lot of snails so if you can control aquatic vegetation in some manner you also reduce the number of snails and then the number of grubs but it's not going to happen you know you're you're not going to stock red ears and a month later your black grub problem is gone it doesn't happen that quick it may take you know a year or two probably multiple years to be honest aquatic vegetation it can be good because obviously it serves as habitat food and cover for lots of aquatic life including fish but excess nutrients really increase the amounts of aquatic vegetation um, and that's problematic so too much you can have too much of a good thing uh, it does because it roots, you know, grows on the sediment. It, it consolidates that sediment and holds it down. Um, it can knock down, you know, wind fetch so you don't get as big of waves and that batter your shoreline and those sort of things. And those plants are conducting photosynthesis and producing dissolved oxygen ultimately. So some goods and bads, um, but if, again, too much of a good thing, bad. Preventative measures, um, we talked about that. You want depth uh, that are really minimized. Uh, you don't want lots of areas with two feet. So minimize the two feet depth or less. Do that with the three to one slope. Um, and really, again, treat the problem, reduce the nutrients. So around your pond, you know, mowed grass probably isn't great. Forest is okay, but not great. It comes with its own set of problems. It can block wind current. Did you say forest? Yeah, forest is not ideal in the sense. Immediately next to the forest. Yes, yep, because if you have a lot of timber, it can block wind currents, and which means that, you know, wind is not coming in contact with the surface of the pond as well as it should and that means that you're not getting a lot of oxygen injection that's how timber but timber on the other hand is kind of a moderate ground cover for controlling runoff too but not as good as prairie or crp which would be ideal and the best how does the leaf litter from the tree yeah 
So when we've dealt with that here, I, I would say that leaf litter is going to result in decomposition and it's obviously with decomposition, you're going to consume oxygen. I don't think that was the problem with this pond and I don't think it was the problem with a lot of ponds that have leaf litter. The bigger problem is blocking of the wind current. Sure. You know, yeah. problem here and I don't quite know what it is, is somebody helped us somehow or another okay. with the problem and I'm not sure exactly what that problem is yet. Yeah. You know, there was an input because it was an event. It was here and then it was gone. You know, it's, yeah, it's something, we got a big input of organic matter somehow or another. I can't believe that's the leaves because the leaves were all, always here. Yeah, right. You know, something else came in and left. Um, you know, just deductively, it came from upstream somewhere. You know, we don't know how or where or what. It could be a uh, faulty septic system. You know, I think that's where we need to look first. But, you know, I'm not pointing the finger at anybody. I don't know, you know, but something happened. You know, so mm -hmm. trout. We stocked our trout and our DOs dipped to, they were bad, like just maybe one or a little bit above one. I'm surprised we didn't lose every one of them, but we didn't, you know. Are people catching the mice fishing? Do you know? Uh, I haven't heard. I know people are catching them up to when the ice came off. Okay, yeah. Because we we went back up to like eight milligrams per liter, and at that point they're fine, you know. So, Sorry, which pond are you talking about here? Yeah, Jefferson County Park Pond, the big one over by the shelter, the bathrooms. Yep. Oh, so, you mean, uh, yes. Pond yeah, we we did a we do a seasonal trout stocking either in the fall or spring. Oh, that's here. Okay. Yeah, yeah, here. If you go up the big hill, shelter. Shelter, yeah. Like it's called a community trout stocking. The idea is, you know, we don't have trout really, you know, in our streams and, you know, areas around here. So we do in Northeast Iowa, we have naturally reproducing trout streams and then a lot of stock trout streams. But we want to expose people to trout fishing. So we'll put them in urban ponds seasonally, fall and spring when temperatures in the ponds are cool. And then, you know, people can experience catching a, a trout and then maybe they're interested in going up and checking out Northeast Iowa, you know, so we'll do that. We put them in and then uh, probably right after that weekend, yeah. that weekend, I don't know, it was a Thursday or Friday we put them in, but yeah, we lost in the end, you know, a couple, well, I don't know, yeah. not quite a couple, hundred, maybe a couple hundred, to be honest, you know, so which means 800 survived, but you know, and then we started taking DO and we shouldn't have had issues with DO. So that's why I say some, some sort of event happened. You know, there was a big input of organic material that ultimately, you know, is dead, whether plant, sewage, whatever, but you know, something was decomposing and the bacteria were consuming oxygen and lowering the level of that pond. That's why she asked about the leaf litter because, you know, there's all kinds of trees, especially on one edge of the pond, that are contributing a lot of leaf litter. But, you know, we've got ponds and lakes all over. They're getting a lot of leaf litter and they don't have the same problem this one did. And that leaf litter was there when they went in and they were fine and then they weren't, you know. So something happened um, and who knows, you know. Um, Wind can mix things and cause turnovers, not necessarily in fall and spring, you know, and when they mix, you can, you can kind of stir up deoxygenated water and cause a temporary issue, so to speak, in some cases. It usually doesn't result in a fish kill, but trout I would call a sensitive species, you know, so, but time will tell. We'll just have to keep an eye on it, you know. Something surprises us every time when we think we understand it, that's all I can say, so. So mechanical control, you can use a rake or they have harvesters that actually pick this stuff. I'll kind of talk about problems with that. And then talked a lot about grass carp and then you can treat plants with herbicides too. But if you're doing this, I feel like you're treating the symptom and not the problem again. You know, so are chemicals the answer? Well, they'll take care of it temporarily, but not long term. Preventing shoreline deepening, reducing those two foot areas, um, sediment retention ponds, catch sediment and nutrients, kind of like you were talking about. You have an upper pond, you know, if you filter it through the upper pond, that would catch most of that stuff. 
95% will be gone by the time it exits to the, to the good pond or the big pond. So tile outlet terraces again, kind of temporarily impounds water, lets the bad stuff settle out, sediment and nutrients, no-till farming. If you tear up the landscape, you know, if you till it, um, and then we get a heavy rain, obviously, you know, sediment and nutrients can make their way away from it. Fencing cattle from banks of water bodies so they don't bust it all up. Prairie planting, that's about the best thing you can do. Their rent, uh, root system is so developed and deep that, and you know, the plants are usually pretty thick. They really reduce surface runoff. They use up all the nutrients, you know, as they knock that water down and they tie all those nutrients up, which aquatic plants can do as well. They'll tie up nutrients, but you know, obviously if you've got half of your pond full of submersible aquatic, it's not good. CRP, you know, essentially is prairie planting. Same thing, but that's a good program um, to utilize. So as far as the mechanical removal, you can actively remove it with a long handled rake and maybe even tie, you know, fasten two uh, rake heads together. So you've got like a double headed rake that you can kind of reach and twist and pull problem is that some aquatic plants spread via fragmentation so though although you're moving it temporarily you're busting it all up and leaving a bunch and you might actually be making the problem worse in the long run so there's the grass cart picture i think somebody was wanting you know that's what they look like they have specific diet preferences. Everybody stalks them thinking, oh, my pond's got green water. I'm going to throw grass carp in. It's going to solve the problem. Nope. They're going to go find submersible aquatics, excrete nutrients back into the water column and make your algae problem potentially worse. So um, not always good. Now, if you stock them in the right number, so, you know, one for your three acre pond, give them about two years to kind of do their job. But you know, also probably wouldn't stock grass carp unless you had a vegetation problem. So vegetation problem would be 20 to 25 percent submerged rooted aquatic coverage in your pond. They shouldn't put any in them. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, don't stock them if you don't need them. So, so right. How many do I need? Yep. You said seven. I right. said, okay, I'll take 11. Yes. Think more, is more is better. Yeah, and that happens a lot, so don't feel bad. A lot of people make that mistake, but... Yeah, if you ever have questions like that, don't hesitate to call us. We'll tell you straight up what what you should do there. Did you say, do you have regular hours? Yeah, 8 to 4.30, uh, Monday through Friday. So that's sort of office hours, because I imagine yep. you're out in the field. We time. are, you know, so especially as we get into spring, summer, yeah. fall, we'll be in and out more. But and Do you accept visits, on, on-site visits? Sure, yep, okay. yeah, yep, we're and open. Are you at that office that's the first on the the red building on top of the hill as you come into Lake Darling State Park. So, yep. Yeah, you can stop in and talk to us. We'll, uh, we'll um, kind of chew the fat with you about anything, ponds or anything you, you want to talk about. But So they can still be legally stocked. We don't stock them in any public ponds whatsoever anymore because we made the same mistake. 1970s, we didn't know about the negative effects of grass carp. So in some lakes, we stocked a thousand you know, grass carp in a 50 acre pond or something, not a good idea. So, you know, and we thought they lived five years and we found out they lived 30. <laughs> you know? But, but uh, one thing that makes you feel better, maybe after what, seven years, they get very lethargic. Yes. They don't eat that much. They don't eat that much, yeah. So you might have some big bets because they can get huge. Yeah, and that's a good point. So, when they're controlling your vegetation, it's usually you're getting them when they're 10 or 12 inches and they're eating a ton because they're putting that energy into growth. Now, once they've neared their growth potential, then they don't eat as much and they're not really benefiting you other than taking up space, you know, so. But grass carp are good to eat too. I mean, I don't know. They're the number two in taste. Yeah, they're very good. Yeah, yeah and you, you know, they get big and cylindrical and they can, like a shark, you can cut grass carp steaks, you know, <laughs> pretty good. They're actually really good. Asian carp are very good too. You know, you can, it's kind of interesting way to prepare those, but they got a pretty well developed rib cage. And so we've caught those and get up under that rib cage and just use a hatchet to kind of bust the rib cage out. You know, it's almost like, you know, ribs, you get cattle ribs or pork ribs or something like that, you know. <laughs> 
and then they've got real thick developed ribs so you can slice them into individuals and wrap them in tinfoil butter and garlic cook them on the grill and then just eat them right off the bone they're pretty tasty yep but so asian carp are very tasty too but you just a lot of people think ah oh, gross i'm not eating that right so I would say yes. I think they're way better. Like common carp, um, I've had a lot of those. Like I started my work on the Mississippi River. So there was a commercial fisherman that had his own fish stand and you could go there and he would have carp on the menu and buffalo and a bunch of other things that you typically wouldn't eat. But he'd only have carp in the fall and early winter because he felt like the flesh was denser and tastier then and it feels like in the warmer months it gets kind of mushy and off flavored you know so um, whereas he would have buffalo on the menu like small mouth big mouth black buffalo all the time but that's very bony but he had a scorer machine and it you know basically score it the whole length of the fillet drop it in oil and the bones are so small that they would just cook off they wouldn't be there anymore and then serve it on top of you know bread onions in a sandwich and tartar sauce is pretty good and you'd have paddle fish which to me it was more of the consistency of like chicken nuggets you know I mean good chicken nuggets not McDonald's chicken nuggets but real chicken you know what I mean and but it I mean it tastes like fish it was the difference can like the consistency you know of chicken but tastes like fish I thought it was really good catfish so but you know all kinds of stuff like that but yeah Common carp tastes different, and of the carps, they're not my favorite. I mean, I, I liked them when you had them on the menu, but if I had to choose, I'd get the other two, you know. So herbicides, copper sulfate, which is an algicide or algicide for controlling filamentous algae. That's primarily what you're seeing covering that pond. It's snotty, it's oily, stringy. They call it horsehair algae. You know, pick it up and it's like a horse tail, you know, but maybe slimier. Duckweed, no. Duckweed, the duckweed's more of this right here. You see these little plants? Yeah, yeah that's duckweed. Duckweed is actually, uh, it's, it's a floating rooted leaf plant. So if you pick up duckweed and flip it over, it actually has little rootlets on the bottom. The copper sulfate takes care of that too. No, not as well. You might get some control, but diquat or reward would be the best thing to control. Um, you know, any sort of, of duckweed would be diquat or reward is the trade name. You know, bluestone would be a trade name for copper sulfate, but copper sulfate is going to be mainly uh, an algicide. That's where its best control is. Now, it's not saying it won't kill some of the duckweed, but usually what you're seeing is a situation where you're full of filamentous algae and you've got duckweed growing in it. And then you apply copper sulfate and 99% of your biomass was filamentous algae. And then 99% of this goes away and you're left with a little duckweed. And you might think you got control, but you really controlled the filamentous algae. You know, glyphosate. So um, glyphosate or rodeo was probably invented to control cattail. <laughs> you know, that's, so in that one, we usually put like a you know, a couple of tablespoons of ivory dish soap in with the rodeo because it's sticky. And when you spray the rodeo on like the cattails or even, you know, lilies, um, lotus, that sort of stuff, it sticks to the leaf and it allows the chemical to penetrate and make its way down to the root. Whereas if you just spray on the chemical, it might run off and never really come in contact with the root of the plant. So cattail, smart weed, you know, water lilies, blah, blah, blah. So, so the diquat is probably the better of the three choices. For coverage for everything? For most things. Yes. Yep, yep. Yeah, and one thing I should mention, so we've all heard of Roundup, right? Should you use Roundup to control aquatic plants of any sort or emergent plants of any sort? Nope. nope. There is that Roundup aquatic, or it's similar to yeah. it, isn't there? Yep. Oh, rodeo. Yep. And there are other trade names. I think there's Aquastar and blah, blah, blah. But basically, it's a glyphosate product, which Roundup is a glyphosate. But the difference is 
the carrier for Roundup is extremely toxic. But that carrier has been removed for rodeo, and that's why then we have to add dish soap, you know, to make it stick to stuff. But rodeo will do the same thing. It's just aquatic safe Roundup, but that doesn't mean you should use Roundup because you will kill fish big time. How much uh, a ratio would you want to add that dish soap? Dish soap, usually, uh, you know, about a one to three. Uh, teaspoons per about 10 gallons, I would say. Oh, wow. so it might yeah, yeah. And, and you might start out with one and just because you're going to set up a little bit and stuff. And obviously, you don't want to wash the machine over full and sort of, you know what I mean? So, just a little squirt, you know, just something to make it stick. And if you're comfortable with how that mixture is looking, you might be able to add just a little bit more, okay. you know, but not a lot, yeah. you know, but just, just enough to make it sticky and. You know, it, if it suds up, that's perfectly kind of normal. That's what's going to happen. Would you ever do that around the beach area or no? Um, yeah, you could. I mean, that soap and stuff is not, not going to hurt. You know, all of these two, I should mention, they have potentially have restrictions. Um, if you call me or you go to your local extension office, they can give you a document. You can even download it, honestly, through the Iowa Extension website. You know, you'd probably be able to find that. It's category five aquatic pesticide application. You have a nice little chart that tells you if the chemical you're using, like Diquat, has any restrictions and what they are. And it might, that restriction might be for cattle or sheep, or you know, if you're applying copper sulfate, you better not have any sheep drinking the water because that would be toxic to them. You know, so swimming restrictions in in your Could case. That affect deer even? Um, yeah, I mean, if it would affect cattle, I guess it would probably affect deer, you know, but I mean, how are you going to control them? <laughs> you know, so they're going to drink whether, it, would it kill them? I don't know, you know, but if you're a livestock provider, obviously, it'd probably be a bigger issue for you, you know. Do any of these have any impact on fish? These do not, if applied according to label instructions. So, you know, if it says, apply one gallon per acre reward which is a common application rate and you apply five yeah you're going to cost some <laughs> you know so the bigger issue with with these here is coverage so if i were going to treat this pond which i'd call 99 percent covered and i applied copper sulfate in august i probably killed every fish in the pond was it the result of this no it was the result of this killing the aquatic vegetation which now has to be decomposed by the bacteria that consume all the oxygen you know so it wasn't a direct result of the herbicide affecting the fish but the secondary results of killing that stuff now there are some chemicals like i get a lot of calls about carmax Carmax does a wonderful job controlling all the vegetation in my pond. Usually I say, don't tell me anymore because that's against federal law <laughs> you know, to apply it. But yes, it works really well because Carmax will basically shut down any pro primary productivity in the pond, period. So in, that, in essence, it sterilizes the pond and removes all aquatic vegetation. Plus, then it hangs around for like, 50 years in the bottom of your pond too. It has a really long half-life, mm -hmm. you know? So, and that's, I think that's why they discovered that one's no, no, and they made it illegal. But, you know, a lot of people still remember it from the good old days. They don't know it's illegal and they apply it. And yeah, it works. But I think with something like that, you're, you're causing more damage and really sac you're sacrificing your health long-term too, you know, to apply something like that. So. Um, I don't think it's worth it. Number one, I don't want to go to prison over some chemical I applied to my pond. That just seems silly, but you know, number two, you're just going to sterilize your pond. And I doubt that's what you're after in the first place, right? So, so fish kill, summer kill. Um, so you get into, it usually happens in late July and August. You have excessive vegetation. Um, you have some event that kills a whole bunch. So, you know, maybe you have a cold rain, kills a whole bunch of vegetation. You know, the water is warm. It's not holding a lot of oxygen. Now you put a stressor on it with that decomposition. It lowers it even more. Usually happens right before sunrise because, you know, in the dark, 
there's no photosynthesis. Things are still decomposing. Things are still breathing. You know, water isn't holding a lot of oxygen. So if we dip even a little bit, it might, you know, reduce it to critical levels, that oxygen level. And if the oxygen level reduces the critical levels, things can die. Fish kills are usually partial. Uh, typically, they're not full kills. You know, people call it, I had a bad fish kill. How bad? I lost 23 fish. That's not bad, that's nothing, you know. Um, some others will call and say, I lost a couple hundred. How big is your pond? Five acres, don't worry about it, you know. If you have a complete fish kill, even on a three quarter acre pond, depending on what time of year that it happens, but you know, say, again, we're into July and August, I'd probably be looking at thousands, if not tens of thousands of fish then you got a problem you know that would be pretty severe I've only ever seen one fish. <laughs> yeah so and that's probably natural mortality <laughs> you know so uh, we get a lot of that too right yep you know, sure yeah yeah so we'll get a lot of questions like that i've seen i didn't see any fish but i see five now well, that could be just simply stress kill so fish are going to spawn um you know like bluegills a guard nest so they're actively fanning those they're chasing everybody off that's you're expending a lot of energy it wears you out you get tired you get a cold rain all of a sudden you know bluegill is going to stay on that nest even though the conditions aren't great you know my job is to make sure that my young survive they're going to stay there come you know heck or high water and temperature is not conducive it stresses them out and they die you know and people call us about that that happens we had it happen at lake darling probably killed a thousand crappies you know not a big deal because we probably had six thousand the yeah they were all spawners you know about that size so that's not a big deal because you know the population might be five thousand crappies but they just produced a giant ear class you know and so like they replaced themselves maybe two times over you know but it happened um Winter kill different, so you get snow and ice on top. You know, snow on top of that ice reduces or completely gets rid of light penetration, no photosynthesis. As you get into late winter, all the oxygen's being used up. We start zonation, making its way to the top of the ice. Have a late winter, it doesn't melt, and fish die under the ice. That's winter kill. That can happen as well. And these things can happen in an area of a pond. Maybe they don't happen pond wide, but in a shallow area where there was lots of aquatic vegetation or where snow collected really deep and the ice didn't thaw as quick. You'd think fish would be like, oh, this is a bad area. I'm going to move to the good area over here. They don't, you know. Some of them are pretty dumb. They just stay there and they die, you know, but that's just what happens, you know, survival of the fittest, right? So. Um, chemicals and excess nutrients so yeah roundup you apply near your pond thinking you're doing something good and you end up killing fish usually you'll see fish sporadically swimming in circles real weird behavior that's usually a chemical if they're piping almost seems like they're wanting to breathe air from the atmosphere it's usually a do thing they don't have any oxygen in the water so they're trying to get as much as they can from the air which the trout here were doing, heads and tails were exposed. They were trying to get out of the water as much as they could with still being in it to try to get air. And it worked because most of them made it through, but surprising. So fish habitat, they're found in close proximity to structure. We know that just by observations, bluegills near vegetation, bass near wood. So this kind of gets at your question, habitat. You can do things like stake beds. So this is an old pallet. It's got uh, oak stakes nailed to it and it's basically weighted down by cinder blocks. I mean, that simulates something like a tree that you've weighted down and provides the same sort of habitat, you know. Um, if you had cedar trees or something, I'd probably do something more like this, just because to me it's more of a natural sort of thing. This is a natural material, but it's obviously artificially built. It will work just as well in a lot of cases, but you know, fish are probably more evolutionarily uh, inclined to use something that they've always seen like that. That's probably just a fact. 
trees, so similar to what you just saw before, but hinge trees off the shoreline, you know, root balls, stumps, etc. All that's good. You have to weight it down essentially because even though the tree's heavy and doesn't seem to be going anywhere, once you put it in the water, it will float you know, for a while until it gets saturated, then it will sink. But if you weight it down and keep it in place, it'll get saturated and stay where you put it. You can put this stuff on top of the ice when it froze over. And then when the ice goes out, it'll sink. But it has to still be weighted, you know, to sink to the bottom or it'll just move around. And you want to put this stuff, you know, look at these pictures. Shoreline, right? Near shore. Don't put it in the deepest part of the pond. Why? Because of zonation. So come summertime, you had big tree pile and 20 feet of water. Will the fish be there? Probably not because they can't breathe, you know. So put most of your material, you know, in shallower water. I would say 8 feet, 8 to 12 feet or less and keep about three or four feet of water over top. That's so you don't dive on top of it if perhaps you're swimming in that area. A you know, kid jumps out of a boat and di you know, dives right on top of a brush pile. That's not what you want, but if you have it four feet under the water, they're gonna be fine. Rocks work really well too. Um, rock piles, shelter belts, that would be when you flatten that stuff out. You know, so basically, you know, have lots of little interstitial spaces that, you know, fish can get into or their prey. It's important for their prey too. Fish will come to it if there's something to eat. Smaller rock, you can vary sizes, build spawning beds. Trenches can be built, you know, change in profile often is conducive to fish. And that's all I got. So, more questions? Did you mention car No, good reason, because those are bad. Ooh, I don't know. You didn't talk to me then. I didn't talk to you. Yep. I, I definitely wanted to check. Yep. Who did you talk to about that? I, and when would be the... Well, okay, about 15 months ago. 15 months ago, yeah, that surprises me. I think I talked to somebody in Des Moines. Des Moines, yep. They said, yep, just fine. No, no, no. It's not, it's not the end of the world. It's not like by doing that, it's going to kill the whole pond or anything. But... What we found is, again, this was something the DNR learned in the 70s. We thought, you know, 60s, 70s, that would be a great way to utilize old tires, is recycle them. You know, that's a big thing in marine environments. You know, let's use tires and create reefs. And we're like, well, yeah, let's do that in a freshwater environment too. But what we found is that, you know, they, they tend to break down you know, old tires too, just if you leave them out for a while and you kind of run your hand across them, you turn black all the way up. So that's, that breakdown is happening. Um, the bigger thing in freshwater environments, they're not really uh, developing plankton, you know, like algae growth, algal growth on a paraphyton. That's the word I'm looking for. So that'd be algae that grows on the surfaces. You know, so basically they just always remain black tires that are breaking down and that's it. So they're providing profile and structure, but unlike like rock, like I showed earlier, that has all the interstitial spaces and is harboring all those aquatic invertebrates and other forms of aquatic life that fish feed on, tires really aren't doing that. You know, so the only benefit you're really getting is the, the profile and structure, but we've also noticed that Whenever fish have the choice of wood, rock, or tires, they go to wood or rock and they don't utilize the tires. You know, so that was telling. And so now, and I think we draw a lake down to do a renovation and we've got a lot of them. They're just full of tires everywhere. And Lost Grove Lake that I build up in the Quad Cities, we had a habitat collection site that was started by the previous biologist but his vision was you know I'll take old pallets and cinder blocks and rocks and etc well people started dumping tires because we had used tires in the past even though he said we don't want tires anymore and I ended up moving 3,500 off the property in order to you know get that lake built I mean so it created a problem for us and it's easy for people, and that's the other thing is that wasn't the first situation. 
you know, where we'd use that. And there's always tires, right? Everybody has tires that drive the car and eventually they're bad and they got to get rid of them. Well, it became our problem. And luckily, Scott County Waste Commission took them all at the landfill for free, no charge to us. But that's not always the case. That was a heck of a deal, you know. Usually it's four bucks per tire or something like that, you know, and that would have just been a nightmare. Give you a little update that you may or may not know. Yeah. Jeremy owns Iowa Tire in Bloomfield. Yeah. Yep. It's the biggest ag tire. He's the biggest ag tire dealer in Iowa. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. And he's just spent a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars on a machine that eats. Eats the tire. Right? Yeah. Year. Oh. Yes, I believe it. <coughs> yep. And utilizing those probably for playground substrate or something, right? Yep. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and that's where I've seen the youth better is like playground substrate around equipment and stuff like that. That works pretty well. I still wonder, like, as it breaks down, and but they usually paint that stuff or something too. I don't know, you know, but so. How beneficial would you say to line the pond with rock would be? Just oh, like armoring shoreline, very beneficial if you're definitely noticing a lot of wind damage yeah. and shoreline erosion. I would target sites where I see that happening first. You know, you could have a stretch 30 foot that's really damaged and a 30 foot stretch next to it that's hardly damaged, I would target that area. Okay, that's good. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. I mean, I, I would love to right. whole pond. Right. But my wife would on. Well, and, and I would say like, I had that question posed by one of our directors when we were building Lost Grove Lake, you know, we were talking about we're, we're targeting all these points and we're gonna have 14,000 feet of armored shoreline. And his question was, well, why don't we just armor the whole thing and then we'll never have a problem. He's right, he was right. We wouldn't with shoreline erosion, but we we would be reducing the diversity of habitat and it'd all be rock, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Whereas if you had some rock and some natural vegetation and you know, just variability like that, yeah. I think is better, yeah, you know. In some instances it may be may make sense to armor the whole thing if it's a small pond you can do it and the whole thing's getting damaged by wind well why not you know but so going back to copper sulfate yep one of the things i've heard is that it settles down into the yes into the bottom, bottom. And it won't go away either. right um whether that's detrimental i don't know right right um i'm not so much worried about that one doing that there's a lot worse things that would definitely settle out and get trapped in the sediment. Copper sulfate, I should mention, there's two ways it can be applied, and that would be liquid or crystals. You know, a lot of people will buy the crystals and make this mistake, you know, got a five gallon bucket and broadcast it. All that sinks to the bottom. And the bigger issue is that copper sulfate is a contact killer. You know, so if my vegetation my algae was in this back corner of the pond and I went out here and applied all my copper sulfate. It never comes in contact with that and therefore it doesn't die, you know. Um, put it into solution. Put it into solution, yeah. yeah. So if you're using crystals, dissolve it in water and it's that slurry that you could apply, you know, then go out here and target and spray it right on top of that mat and you'll get your best kill. That's the mistake a lot of people make is they just throw it out here, even if it's liquid, they dump it out in the middle thinking it will go everywhere. Well, it really needs to be sprayed on top of the vegetation in order to come in contact the best and kill it. So I think that's the bigger issue than it collecting in the sediment. I think you're okay. Copper sulfate, quite honestly, you probably drink it every day because they use it to control algae in your tap water, you know, along with many other things like chlorine and whatever, you know, so. They feed it to hogs. What? It's, that doesn't affect like swimming. Copper, so, yeah. copper sulfate is one of the most benign ones. Okay. Yeah, I, I think you'd be fine. No, I'm not saying drink it out of the bottle because yeah. that probably wouldn't is be smart. Is some of that okay for a pond though? What's that? Well, just the algae that's... Yes. Yeah. No, algae's not bad. It's perfectly natural. You just don't want 
again, if you got to the point of 20 to 25% surface coverage, yeah. it'd start making me nervous and I'd knock it back. Yeah. Hey, you know? on that, what we do is we have a, oh, a landscape rake about this and yeah. then we'll put a noodle on it. Yes. So that, you know, you might, if you have those issues, yeah. you just throw it out, pull it in with a rope. And yep. That's our professional uh, moss remover yes. volunteer of the year. Awesome. <laughs> yep. No, that stuff will work. And, and algae isn't one of those that you have to worry about fragmenting. So, you know, mechanical removal makes a lot of sense. Curly leaf pondweed that you mentioned, that one is invasive, but it's been in the United States since like 18... 63 I don't know if I'm exactly right but a long time that's the point you know so even though it's invasive it's kind of habituated and that may be why the city of Fairfield doesn't get too worried about her they just you know I mean maybe they don't understand well it could it could you know um, I've seen it be real bad in some spots I've got it Lake Belvedere be the good good example Keokuk County every spring we have curly leaf pondweed about 12 foot out from shore you know i mean it's just clogged all the way around um they have some mounds there and it inhabits the top of that yeah i mean um you could and they would probably provide some level of control but i don't know that the risks you know the detriment that they could cause would be worth it, even though we'd stock them in the right amount. Um, we prefer not to do uh, control that way. We intend, we like to do, we have an aquatic invasive species specialist, or two of them now, and now we're gonna have an aquatic invasive species vegetation specialist that you know is going to be traveling throughout the state targeting those problem areas with herbicides, actually. And controlling it that way and education that's a big thing too no yeah right right but you know this right it's a bit controversial and I go back to the reason that we do probably more herbicide treatments is because you know there is still no one that can guarantee me that every grass carp we stalk is triploid and is sterile and that's the other thing too um, you know we know hybrid sunfish still have the ability to reproduce they're not completely sterile grass carp is supposed to be vastly different from that in the sense that they are supposed to be sterile but again I go back to life finds a way and you know things evolve and they change so bottom line though let's just focus on the fact that you know they stocked Say we're putting in 200 grass carp and four of those happen to be diploid. We got a problem now, you know, we have a real problem. They're gonna reproduce and pretty soon, you know, we have grass carp all over the place. And that can in turn, once they take care of our vegetation problem, remember they're not very efficient at extracting nutrients. So they're excreting most of those nutrients back in the environment which causes this algal bloom. So now we don't have any curly leaf pondweed, but Lake Belvedere is a big green pool of water. You know, that's what we don't want. Now we just, we fixed one problem and created another, maybe two, you know what I'm saying? Well, so, the Asian carp is a good example of that. Yep. Of, uh, they might theoretically ruin our rivers. Yes. So any invasive thing like that, like I was, Brittany and I was riding around the farm the other day, or it's been a while back, and she said, now that's an invasive um, thistle, but that's a, a native one. I'm yeah. like, I didn't know the difference, and most farmers probably don't. So this has a value to the ecology of that area, where this is not, God didn't put it here. Right. So somebody else yeah. did, and it's doing some damage. How right. How much damage we don't know. Yeah, and I like that point because if you think about it, at, at the heart of it, grass carp is an invasive species. It was okay with us for a while until we realized it wasn't. Yeah, until we realized it wasn't. Now, there are not too many, you know, pheasant would be an example of a species we brought in, and trout might be a, a fish example of species that we were able to habituate and they've caused limited environmental damage, although I would tell you, that opinion would differ greatly if we go to the western states, right? 
rainbow trout or probably the devil out there because they've destroyed native stocks of cutthroats and things like that. You know, and we've lost those species because we introduced something that was never there to begin with. So, you know, it depends on where. I mean, pheasants seem to be about the most benign, but they're not without impacts. They're impacting something. You know, if we go back far enough, I'm sure we can find something that didn't do so good because we brought pheasants in, but they have commercial value, and so we tolerate them. Great Lakes is stocked Pacific salmon. Those weren't native to the Great Lakes at all, but they developed huge commercial value because now there's big sport fisheries that are outfitted to go after, you know, those fish and whatever, so they're kind of here to stay. It's catch-22. We stocked them, the sport fishery, commercial fisheries, etc. they call it on, and then all of a sudden, you know, we're going to be stocking them from here to eternity because not doing it would just destroy, you know, those businesses and those sort of things. So, you know, I would say that agencies like ours, honestly, that we make mistakes, and it's not because you know, it, we learn stuff, you know what I mean? That's just part of the process. You do something. Heck, they used to stock Atlantic salmon in Iowa in the 1800s, late 1800s. Because, you know, back then the thought was, those do really great, they're awesome to catch, let's bring them into our home state. We don't have to go as far and people can catch them here too. Nobody had any idea about the biology and the fact that you can't just stock them in a small impoundment or even even the Iowa Great Lakes, which are natural lakes, they, that's not the environment they evolved in. They, they won't do well, and they didn't, you know. They used to stock frogs all over the state of Iowa. Frogs, frogs. yeah. <laughs> you know, so, it just, they used to stock everything, because that was the thing. It's good here, so we want it here too, but. So is that why we had frogs in the 70s, but now bullfrog wise? Uh, I don't know, you know, they were doing this back in the 1800s, so it's probably unrelated, but, you know, I think more so uh, herbicide, pesticide applications yeah. are more responsible for changes that you've seen in those sort of populations. What's that? Habitat. Habitat. Habitat loss is a big thing, too. Yeah. So all those things are occurring, but, yeah, I mean, we didn't understand watersheds. That's something we understand better, you know. Heck. When I'm retired and gone, they'll probably, you know, there'll be somebody looking back on me saying, why did they do that? You know, but that's, that's how it goes, you know, so, but we change and adapt and try to do the right thing moving forward. And I think we've made leaps and bounds, but, you know, we're not perfect by any stretch, I doubt, you know, so do the best we can. Well, even like your property, build that on, you have more pride now because you made it better. Sense is how I kind of view it all. Yep. He's the same way with his. He's taken a piece of ground and made it better and fell in love with it. And you care about that pond and, and yeah. your 13 fish. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I bet you they end up not surviving because there's just not enough food. There. Right. Well, that's that wise thing. Yeah. 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 Well, but there's that's. Seven dollars each, too. Yep. Uh, yeah. Right. And the terms of the grass carp, if they don't, that might be a benefit to you long term, you know. So I said if the grass carp don't survive, maybe that benefits you, you know, in terms of the pond more so in the future, you know. So well, what, was, what preceded it was a pond about one third the size. It was only five feet deep. Oh, and yeah. And it was just a green, a green mat with yeah. slime on the top. Yeah, so that was a pond that was too shallow. Usually when we... I don't know if I talked about it, but depth-wise, we talked about slope, but depth-wise, you probably want uh, no more, well, you don't want, you want eight feet or more. Let's put it that yeah, way. That's what I eight feet or more. And honestly, I would probably lean more towards 10 or 12 maximum yeah. feet, maximum depth, than eight, you know, well, would I be better. A few feet that's 14. You know, yes, yeah. I would say, then I think my point is ideal. Right. Well, and I would say this too, just because I said don't have any two, in general, don't have many two foot deep areas doesn't mean you shouldn't have any, right? right? But you're just trying to minimize those areas. Yeah, yep. little yes. Pond, little cove that's yeah, shallow. Yep. About, you know, twice Sounds good. And yep. Because if you think about it, uh, like bluegills would be a good example of spawning 18 inches to three feet of water, right? So. I, um, I, I had some old chicken wire 
Yeah. That, that it got, I, I had to pull it out of the grass and got stretched into a kind of, like this, instead of being flat, it sure. was like this. So I decided to pin about 40 feet of it in about a foot of water. Okay. And the little baby fish, this long, were really attracted to that. And they seemed to stick around. Oh, hanging around that? My, my only worry would be is when they get a little bit bigger, it's going to act like a gill net and they're going to get stuck in it, I guess. So, depending on how big the holes are. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So, I could see small fish hanging around it. It's just. Yeah. Right. But yeah, I just don't want the juvenile fish hopefully not getting caught in it, would be thing. So, I don't know. <laughs> you know? So, yep. But no, wood and rock are always the best. Cedar trees are great. They last quite a long time. If you can bundle, yeah, cedar trees are great. Uh, old road culverts work. Oh, is there a source of cedar trees? That, you know, a source. I would say talk to local farmers. They don't want them in their fields, you know, so, or pastures. They would want they them going. Yes. Crazy. Yeah. I think you could find a source, but it'd take talking to, you know, some local yeah. farmer. But they'd probably be glad to give them to you. But my guess would be you have to cut them down and haul them away on your own. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, cool. Yep. So. Oh, this has been very educational. Well, thank you. Yep, you bet, you bet. So. Yep. And feel free to give me a call anytime. Oh, yeah, no problem. Yeah, we'll, we'll have these conversations with you on the phone if there's specific questions you want answered, you know, we can address them, but... So. Problem with pilots, you do whatever you do to them. Yeah. But you can't see what's inside. Right. Yeah. Well. If, <laughs> yeah, I know you. Yeah. You can't. That's my job. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's all speculation. Right. And that's. Right. Oh, I got ten pound bass in my pocket. Right. There's all kinds of. Them. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> I saw one once. Right. Right. There's a lot of that. Yeah, we we get a lot of fish stories, so to speak. You know. And yeah, I mean, everybody has the world's largest snapping turtle, you know, that's this big around or Volkswagen size, you know, a little bug. No, I don't believe you. Yeah, I've been sampling them for years. I've never caught one. Uh, my son and I went fishing in August and we pulled crankbaits deep because we've been fishing at Mississippi. Yeah. And he caught a nine and a half pound bass. Nice. So it would have been one of the original back to the uh well the one of the original fish put in there but yep. to your point on starting with all kindergartners they all grew up together by the time they're 12th graders that's yep. when they're that step yeah that you want a that 10 pound bash right for. right but yep. it takes a lot to get them there a lot to get them and the other thing i didn't talk about is yeah. you know people people often want big bluegills and big bass but that's doesn't work that way you can't have both typically not saying you can't have respectable bass and you know big bluegills that's probably more realistic but if you want trophy bass you know uh, you, typically you're going to have something sacrificed i guess i should say as a result of that you know typically intermediate sized bass are the ones that are feeding heavily on bluegill. So if you've got a pond that's dominated mainly by intermediate sized bass, you're probably going to have big bluegills because they're going to trim down those populations and allow those bluegills to grow very rapidly. So the bluegills might not be, you not, not, might not be catching one every two minutes, but when you do catch one, it might be really big. And we're not catching big, really big yep. bluegill either ice fishing, but mm -hmm. we have a, we've sunk a lot of structure. Right. Us. Right. Do you have a lot of intermediate sized bass or are you dominated by big bass or, you know? There was a winter fish kill last year with several of the large bass. Large bass. Yeah, we lost some good yeah. Big ones. Okay. But your intermediates probably survived and that they may change the dynamic. It might take a little time, but you know, honestly, the other thing I should say is every pond is different. Yeah. You know, every pond is different. So your pond, for whatever reason may not be capable of producing 10 inch bluegills it may just never do that you know whereas the one and it, you know a mile away might you know it's just their characteristics can be very different and it's hard to pinpoint exactly why could be basin slope you know different different stretches of littoral zone you know where you have pretty steep 
shorelines and you go to deep water really quick, that can really put predators on the prey because they have a very limited space to operate in, which means they're very efficient at cropping them off and your bluegills grow very big because their populations have been reduced. Whereas if you have extended littoral areas, they have a lot of escape routes. They're not as efficient, those bass, at reducing those numbers. And then, you know, more of them survive and their growth is affected in a negative way. They don't grow as big. So, I mean, you've got those sort of things operating too. A lot of information there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's all about, you know, how efficient the bass are at controlling the prey. And the more they control and eat and reduce the population size of the bluegill, the faster those bluegills grow because they have more food. That's, you know, if they're not efficient, then they don't, yeah. their population remains large and, and they don't grow. Being efficient would be nuclear yeah. bomb, right? Because it's, it's harder for that fish to sneak up on them. Well, yeah, to a point, but it gets too cloudy and then there are sight feeding fish, then they can't find them either, okay. you know. So sometimes a dirtier pond might be conducive to bluegill growth in a sense, but not too dirty because then it's gonna affect growth of both. You know what I mean? But there's a balance there. It's gotta be perfect. Bass gotta be able to see them, to knock them down to a level that's conducive to their growth because now they have more resources to share amongst individuals. If you push it too far one way or the other, then it's all out of whack. So. Yeah. Are any of those little babies that I saw at the end of October going to survive under the ice? Possibly, yeah. 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 I'd say the bigger you are as you go into winter, probably the greater chance you will survive. So, of those little ones, you know, you might lose a good portion, but some will survive, you know. So, but, you know. Numbers will get whacked by the winter and they'll go into spring and there's lots to eat for the little guys that make it and they'll grow very rapidly. So there's a benefit on the other end. That would be the feed bluegills for instance, fish food. Food. Yeah. That's one of those things that's a feel good thing for you. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, obviously they're gonna get some energy and it, but I'm not sure how much it translates to growth because it's probably a small portion of what they need and they're eating on a daily basis, you know, so, but, you know, to the bass bluegill relationship, when bass get big, okay, now their focus changes from growth, they're focused on growth to reproduction, okay, so now most of their energy goes towards reproduction, it's kind of like the grass carp, they're eating enough to sustain themselves, they're not really controlling populations well, you know, so if you're managing for trophy big bass and you got big bass probably not controlling the bluegill populations as well which means that your bluegill are typically going to be smaller population wide if that makes sense. We have a lot smaller bluegill than I thought we would. Yeah. We've, we've caught some bigger ones but we don't really fish it as hard as we should. Yeah. You know but we have never really kept fish other than some kids that let them suck it all the way in and ruin the gill. And they yeah. Go. Right. Right, right, right. But you know, I mean, not that you would make a huge impact, but we don't have, we have, we have panfish bag limits in Iowa, but it wasn't really necessarily based on biology. Biology tells us we don't really need bag limits on bluegills and crappies, you know what I mean? But there's a societal aspect, you know, there's a person that feels that you don't need a five gallon bucket of bluegills to go home with you on a daily basis, you know? So that's kind of a balance between the two perspectives. But biologically speaking, bluegills are prolific enough with their reproduction and crappies that honestly, you know, I get a lot of people worried about size, but that person's taking bluegills that are seven inches, that's bad. Or, you know, crappies only eight inches. Well, they'll eat just fine, but there's no problem with taking those because if you think about the amount that they're producing on an annual basis, you're probably not impacting. Even if you take every bluegill and crappie you're getting, you're not impacting those populations to any great degree because they're going to trump you on the next spawning event, you know? So. And can they, like the bluegills, spawn five times? Yes, in, in some years, yeah, yeah. 
the biggest spawn is always, you know, in June, you know, end of May, beginning of June, and that kind of time frame there. That's the biggest one. They'll have subsequent events. Five times would be a lot, but they probably definitely get three, in, you know. And in some years, depending on how, like this year, we were pretty warm, pretty late. They might have got even more, you know. But they'll never be the numbers of is that first spawning event, it's, you know. How, how about, and then I'll be done asking yeah. questions, but so we have a silt pond or a bait pond above. Yep. Is it realistic to think that we could actually grow enough minnows there to flush them on down in there, or is that a, a joke? Um, no, it's not a joke, but like, are you producing in their fat heads or what? Well, I mean, at first, uh, Blazo said, the yeah. one guy said, put some bass in there. Yeah. And I'm, I don't remember if we did or not, but right. it, that would have been a big mistake. Yeah. Uh, but we put bluegill, and then there was lots of bluegill. Sure. But I, I, I think it'd be better to have just uh, snicker candy bars in there, meaning yeah. uh, the minnows. Minnows. Because they love those the best of them. Yeah. Well, and like a lot of times, uh, a private fish dealer will say, you know, stock minnows when you'd stock your bass, you know, and the idea is that you get, give them something to eat. But if you got your bluegill in fall, they should have spawned by June and gave them plenty to eat anyway. Now, the minnows won't hurt anything, but the bass will find every one of them and eat them. Yeah, and so, like, my technician always jokes with people, yeah, if you're going to stock a thousand fathead minnows, I got a better option, just write me the check <laughs> instead. You know, because I'll use the money better. You're just going to waste it, yeah. is what he's telling you. You know, you're just wasting money. And that's true because they will find every fathead and eat them. So, unless you're constantly stocking fathead minnows, they're just not going to be there very long. Especially as you start developing, you know, bigger fish. Bigger fish yeah. They're just going to be gone. Oh, so, that that yeah. So, you could produce them and put them in that pond, but they're just going to get eaten and they're going to be gone. And so, you just get into the vicious cycle the bluegill are providing your prey base period you know so perch yellow perch walleyes northern pike don't really work because they're all cool water species and we have warm water environments so not saying they won't survive but they won't reach growth potentials they won't do particularly well